The Proud and No, just kidding. Pride and Prejudice <laughs> by Deborah Marha. I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> Nailed it. External Longburn House Day. Fade up on a young woman as she walks through a field of tall meadow grass. She is reading a novel entitled First Impressions. This is Lizzie Bennett, 20, good humored, attractive, and nobody's fool. She approaches Longbourn, a fairly run down 17th century house with a small moat around it. Lizzie jumps up onto a wall and crosses the moat by walking a wooden plank duck board, a reckless trick learned in early childhood. She walks past the back of the house where, through an open window to the library, we see her mother and father, Mr. and Mrs. Bennett. My dear Mr. Bennett, have you heard Netherfield Park is let at last? We fall Lizzie into the house, but still overhear her parents' conversation. Do you not want to know who has taken it? As you wish to tell me, I doubt I have any choice in the matter. Internal. <laughs> Long, boring, continuous. As Lizzie walks through the hallway, we hear the sound of piano scales plodding through the afternoon. She walks down the entrance hall, past the room where Mary, 18, the blue stocking of the family, is practicing and finds Kitty, 16, and Lydia, 15, are listening at the door to the library. Lizzie pokes Lydia. Lizzie! Kitty! What have I told you about listening at- Never mind that! There's a Mr. Bingley who's arrived from the north. Which, more than one chase. On 5,000 a year. Really? And he's single. The, the eldest and very beautiful, if rather naive sister, materializes at Lizzie's elbow. Who's single? A Mr. Bingley, apparently. Shh. She clamps her ear to the door. Oh, really, Kitty? Lydia leans in whilst Jane and Lizzie strain to hear without appearing to. Internal. Library. Longbourn. Continuous. Mr. Bennett is trying to ignore Mrs. Bennett. What a fine thing for our girls. How can it affect them? My dear Mr. Bennett, how can you be so tiresome? You know that he must marry one of them. Oh, so that is his design in settling here. Mr. Bennett takes a plant he's been looking out from his table and walks out of the library <laughs> into the corridor where the girls are gathered, Mrs. Bennett following. Good heavens. People. Interior corridor at Longbourn, the same. He walks through the girls into the drawing room, pursued by Mrs. Bennett. So you must go and visit him at once. Interior drawing room, Longbourn, the same. <laughs> Mr. Bennett walks to a table and places the plant in the light. Mary is still practicing the piano. The girls flock behind him. Are you listening? You never listen! Ugh. You must. Papa! At once! There is no need, for I already have. The piano stops. All frozen silence. They all stare. You have? When? How can you tease me, Mr. Bennett? Have you no compassion for my poor nerves? You mistake me, my dear. I have a high respect for them. They have been my constant companions these 20 years. Is he admirable? He's sure to be handsome. <laughs> With 5,000 a year, it would not matter if he had warts and a leer. I will give my hearty consent to his marrying whichever of the girls he chooses, warts and all. Who's got warts? So, will he come to the ball tomorrow? I believe so. <laughs> Lydia and Kitty shriek with excitement and jump up and down. Yay! I have to have the, your spotted muslin, Jane. No, I need it. It makes Kitty look like pudding. And not the kind you eat. <laughs> oh, please, Jane. I'll lend you my green slippers. They both look onto Jane and pull at her arms. Mr. Bennett winks at Lizzie. Exterior Longbourn House Day. A wide shot of the house as we continue to hear the girls argue over what they will wear. Interior, assembly, assembly room, Meriton Village, night. The local subscription dance is in full swing. It's a rough and ready, though enthusiastic affair. Women, farmers, small time squires with their ruddy cheeked daughters. Lydia and Kitty are dancing. <sighs> I can't breathe. Oh, how am I gonna dance all night if I can't breathe? My troubles already. Lizzie and Jane are a little apart from their family. Jane looks breathtaking. Well, if every man in this room does not end the evening in love with you, then I am no judge of beauty. Oh, man. 
Oh, they are far too easy to judge. They're not all bad. Humorless poppycocks, in my limited experience. <laughs> One of these days, Lizzie, someone will catch your eye and then you'll have to watch your tongue. She stops speaking and stares. A dazzling group enters the room. George Bingley, oh, he has a first name, 25, a good hearted soul. <laughs> A hearted soul, but prone to bumbling embarrassment when his enthusiasms get the better of him. His sister Caroline, 23, a victim of every latest fashion, counting herself superior to most companies she encounters. And finally, Mr. Fitzwilliam Darcy, 27, dashing, brooding with an introversion which could be misconstructed as hauteur. They are dressed in the highest moods. The music and dancing stops, so the local people turn and stare. The newcomers, creatures from another world, Made quite a stir. Darcy surveys the hall. He catches Lizzie's eye. She stares with a kind of surprised shock. Caroline Bingley turns to Darcy. Oh dear, we are a long way from Grosvenor Square, are we not, Mr. Darcy? He does indeed look superior to the assembled company. Sir William Lucas, 53, a hale but unsophisticated member of the self-made gentry, hurries to greet the new arrivals. He leads them down the center of the dance floor towards the best seats in the room, stopping occasionally to introduce them to various parties. Lizzie's great friend, Charlotte Lucas, Sir William's daughter, an intelligent, sensible woman in her late 20s, comes to Lizzie's side. So which of the painted peacocks is our Mr. Bingley? He's the one on the right. On his left is his sister. And the person with the quizzical brow? That, my good friend, is Mr. Darcy. Oof, he looks miserable, poor soul. Miserable he may be, but poor he most certainly is not. Tell me. Ten thousand a year, and he owns half of Derbyshire. The miserable half? They share a complicit giggle. Sir William Lucas arrives <laughs> with Darcy and the Bingleys to introduce his daughter Charlotte and the Bennett family. Behind them, the music and dancing restart where they left off. My eldest daughter, you know, Mrs. Bennet, Miss Jane Bennet, Elizabeth and, Mar and Miss Mary Bennet. It is a pleasure. I have two others, but they are already dancing. Mr. Bingley is transfixed by Jane and gazes openly at her. <laughs> Delighted to make your acquaintance. And may I introduce Mr. Darcy of Pemberley and Derbyshire. A stiff bow from Darcy, with his smiles, Darcy does not. Interior, assembly room, Meryton Village, night. Moments later, Lizzie is standing mm -hmm. in a small group with Jane Bingley, Miss Bingley, and Darcy. I like it here. Sure, Mr. Very much. The library at Netherfield, I've heard, is one of the first in the country. Yes, it fills me with guilt. He looks at Jane and a little blush starts around his collar. Not a good reader, you see. I prefer being out of doors. I mean, I mean, I can read. Of course, I'm not suggesting that I can't read outdoors, of course. I wish I read more, but there always seems so many other things to do. That's exactly what I mean. He beams at Jane gratefully. The first dance ends. Lady and Katie rush past in a state of high excitement. <sighs> Mama, you will never, ever, 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 ever believe what I'm about to tell you. You've decided to take the veil? <laughs> Lydia ignores him. Tell me quickly, my love. The regiments are coming! <laughs> this is Bennett Creek, too. Mr. Bennett winces. To be stationed the whole winter, stationed in the village, just right there. Now all three Bennett females shriek and Lydia actually jumps up and down. <laughs> <laughs> officers, officers, as far as the eye can see. Uh, how will we meet them? Oh, it's easy. You just walk up and down in front of them and drop something. Lydia pantomimes the actions for Kitty. They pick it up. You say, oh, thank you, sir, and blush prettily, and then you're introduced. Couples begin to form for the next dance. Mr. Bingley turns to Jane. May I have the honor? They live to dance. Lizzie addresses Darcy as much to distract him from her family as any other reason. Do you dance, Mr. Darcy? Mm, not if I can help it. 
Lizzie, Darcy, and Mrs. Bingley stand in uncompanionable silence. On the dance floor, Mr. Bingley is dancing with Jane. His ears are bright pink. Mrs. Bennet, with a group of other mothers, watches the young couple with rather too obvious satisfaction. The dress becomes her, does it not? Though, of course, my Jane needs little help from courtiers. Lizzie wanders through the throng. She looks at Bingley and Jane dancing. Jane is calm and demure. Bingley clearly smitten. Uh, interior, assembly rooms, Maritime Village, night. Later, Darcy is joined by an exhilarated Bingley. Upon my word, I've never seen so many pretty girls in my life. You are dancing with the only handsome girl in the room. Oh, she is the most beautiful creature I have ever beheld. But her sister, Lizzie, is very agreeable. They have stopped at the edge of the dance floor, but have not seen Lizzie and Charlotte, who are hiding behind a pillar. Lizzie starts to smile. A perfectly horrible, I dare say, but uh, not handsome enough to tempt me. Lizzie stops smiling. You had better return to your partner and enjoy her smiles, for you are wasting your time with me. Bingley goes off. Cut to Lizzie and Charlotte. Count your blessings, Lizzie. If he liked you, you'd have to talk to him. Precisely. As it is, I would not dance with him for all of Derbyshire, let alone the miserable half. Charlotte smiles at her friend, but sees none less that she is stung. Interior assembly rooms, Maritime Village, night. Later, Bingley politely dancing with Charlotte. As he does so, he catches sight of Jane dancing with somebody else. A look of pure longing, but he cannot dance every dance with her. Lizzie's two, two is dancing and clocks this. Lydia and Kitty are exuberantly dancing too, laughing and chatting. Darcy stands watching a look of infinitely superior boredom on his fine features. Interior assembly room, Maritime Village night. Bingley is standing with Jane, Lizzie, and Mrs. Bennet, and Darcy. Your friend, Miss Lucas, is most amusing young woman. Yes, I adore her. It is a pity she is not more handsome. Mama! But Lizzie will never admit that she is playing. Of course, it is my Jane who is considered the beauty of the country. Oh, Mama, County. please! <laughs> <laughs> when she was only fifteen, there was a gentleman so much in love with her that I was sure he would make her an offer. However, he did write her some very pretty verses. Oh, my please. And that put paid to it. I wonder who first discovered the power of poetry in driving away love. I thought that poetry was the food of love. Of a fine, stout love, it may be. But if it is only a vague inclination, I am convinced that one poor sonnet will kill it stone dead. Darcy looked at Lizzie with a glimmering of interest. So, what do you recommend to Courage affection. Lizzie turns and looks at Darcy square on. Dancing. Even if one's partner is barely tolerable. She gives him a dazzling smile. Darcy looks startled. He has no idea if he heard him. Now it is his turn to blush. End on a wide shot of the assembly rooms and the dance continuing. Interior of Lizzie and Jane's bedroom, one born night. Lizzie and Jane are both in the same bed under the covers. They are too excited to sleep. Jane puts on an extra pair of socks to keep herself warm. <coughs> Mr. Bling is just what a young man ought to be. Sensible, good-humored, handsome, conveniently rich. You know perfectly well, I do not believe marriage should be driven by thoughts of money. I agree entirely. Only the deepest love will persuade me to matrimony, which is why I will end up an old maid. Do you really believe he likes Lizzie? Jane, he danced with you most of the night and stared at you for the rest of it. But I give you leave to like him. You've liked many a stupider person. Lizzie. You're a great deal too apt to like people in general, you know. All the world is good and agreeable in your eyes. That is friend. I can't believe he said about you. Mr. Darcy, I could more easily forgive his vanity had he not wounded mine. But no matter. I doubt we shall ever speak again. We move away from the bed and out through the window to take in the starry night sky. Interior dining room, long born day. Mrs. Bennet presides over breakfast with endless description of the ball. Mary is doing some needlework, whilst Lydia, Kitty, and Jane blurrily eat. 
And he danced the third with Mrs. Lucas, poor thing. It is a shame she is not more handsome. There's a spinster in the making, no mistake. The fourth with Miss King of little standing, and the fifth again with Jane. If he'd had any compassion for me, he would have sprained his ankle in the fifth, first set. Oh, Mr. Bennet, the way you carry on, anyone would think the girls looked forward to a grand inheritance. Lizzie rolls her eyes at Mr. Bennet. They've heard this speech many times before. Kitty, be so kind as to pass the butter. As you well know, Mr. Bennet, when you die, which may in fact be very soon, as soon as I can manage it, our girls will be left without a roof over their head nor a penny to their name. Oh, mother, please, it's ten in the morning. Betsy, the maid, enters the room and interrupts Mrs. Bennet's babbling. <clears throat> a letter addressed to Mrs. Bennet, ma'am, from Netherfield Hall. Praise the Lord, we are saved! Betsy gives, her, gives the letter to Jane. Make haste, Jane, make haste. Oh, happy day. Oh, Mom, please. Mrs. Bennet takes Jane's toast from her hand and whips her napkin off. It is, it's from Caroline. Mrs. Bennet is stopped in her tracks. He's invited me to dine with her. Her brother will be dining out. Dining out? Can I take the carriage? Out where? Let me see that. Oh, Mom, County. please. It tweaks the letter from Jane's grasp. It's too far to walk. Unaccountable of him. Dining out indeed. Mama, the carriage for Jane? Certainly not. She will go on horseback. Horseback? <laughs> Exterior countryside day. Jane arrives to the countryside, a distant rumble of thunder. She looks up. Exterior garden day. A louder rumble of thunder. Betsy hastily pulls clothes from a line. It's bucketing down heavily now. Lizzie runs through the garden. She pulls the towel from the wash line as she passes. Exterior, interior, hall, dining room. Long born day. Mr. and Mrs. Bennett look out at the pouring rain. Lizzie rushes in with the towel and begins drying her hair with it. Excellent. Now she will have to stay the night, exactly as I predicted. Good grief, woman. Your matchmaking skills are becoming positively occult. Though I don't think, Mama, you can reasonably take credit for making it rain. Let's hope she doesn't catch her death. Interior, Netherfield, day. A footman opens the great door to find Jane standing there, soaked. She sneezes. Oh, dear! Yeah. <laughs> Interior, kitchen room, long born day. Lizzie reads a letter. Kitty and Lydia are also present. And my kind friends will not hear of me returning home until I am better. But do not be alarmed, excepting a sore throat, a fever, and a headache, there is nothing wrong with me. I hope you're satisfied, Mother. Well, my dear, if our daughter does die, it will be a comfort to know that it was all in pursuit of Mr. Bingley. People do not die of colds. Though she might well perish with the shame of having such a mother. Mr. Bennett laughs, but Lizzie is genuinely angry. I am going to Netherfield at once. <laughs> she stomps out. Exterior countryside. <laughs> Exterior countryside, Netherfield day. Lizzie strides across the vast muddy field, slipping as she goes. Netherfield is in view on the horizon. She stops to take it in, then carries on down an even more muddy track. Interior, Netherfield, breakfast room day. In the large grand dining room, Caroline and Darcy are eating breakfast. It's very formal, in fact, frigid compared to the volatile Bennett household. Darcy is reading the newspaper. Caroline is reading a letter. Apparently, Lady Bathurst is redecorating her ballroom in the French style. A little unpatriotic, don't you think? Mr. Darcy is about to answer when the door opens. A footman appears, his face rigid with dis disapproval. Miss Lizzie Bennet. Lizzie comes in, her face flushed, her skirt covered in mud. She looks ravishing. Darcy stares at her, then quickly rises to his feet. Caroline Bingley, astonished, looks at her up and down. Good lord, Miss Bennet. Have you walked here? I have. I'm so sorry. How is my sister? She's upstairs. Show Mrs. Bennet the way, Alfred. Alfred. Lizzie leaves a beat. Goodness, did you see her petticoat? Six inches deep in mud. No response. And her hair, so blousy and untidy. I think her concern for her sister does her credit. A little pause. Caroline recovers. Oh, yes. It's 
Shocking to have a bad cold. I dislike excessively being ill myself. Interior Netherfield stairs day. Lizzie rushes up the stairs to meet Bingley halfway. His face lights up when he sees her. Miss Lizzie! Oh, I'm so glad to see you. How is she? She has a violent cold. <laughs> we shall get better. We shall get better. I will have a, a bed made for you. You must be our guest here until Jane recovers. Interior Netherfield, Jane's bedroom day. Lizzie goes into the bedroom where Jane lies in bed, feverish and ill. The blinds are drawn. Jane! Jane's face lights up. Lizzie kisses her. <laughs> <laughs> Your face is so cold. They're being so kind to me. I feel such a terrible position. Don't worry. I don't know who was more pleased about your being here, Mama or Mr. Bingley. Bingley enters. Thank you for tending my sister so diligently. It seems she is in better comfort here than she would be at home. Uh, it, it's a pleasure. I mean, not a pleasure that she's ill, of course not, but a pleasure that she's here being ill. Interior staircase, Netherfield Day. Caroline berates her brother. Stay? She is a perfectly sweet girl, but save being an excellent walker, there's very little to recommend her as a house guest. Uh, I thought she showed remarkable spirit all this way. The eldest Miss Bennet, as you know, I hold in excessive regard. But as for the rest of them? She walks down two steps and ter- turns back. Do you realize their uncle is in train? In Cheapside? If they had uncles enough to fill all the I will not make me them not make them one jot less agreeable, Carolyn. <laughs> Long boring day. Mr. Bennett is admiring a huge boar which has been delivered to cover his so- sows. Mr. Hill, the manservant, stands with him. Mrs. Bennett bustles up looking smug. <clears throat> it's all going according to plan. He's head over heels already. Now all he needs is a little encouragement. Who's that, my blossom? Oh, don't torment me, Mr. Bennett. I mean, Mr. Miss Bingley, as you well know, he doesn't mind a bit that she hasn't a penny, for he has enough for the two of them. Kitty and Lydia rush past as the distant sounds of drums and trumpets mingle with the sniffing of Giles' shears. Oh my god. Wait for me! <laughs> Mr. Bennett gazes at their departing figures, sucking his teeth with relief. He turns back to the boar. Exterior American Village Day. Mrs. Bennett and her two daughters rush down the street into the village. Dogs who bark, children run alongside as a regiment of soldiers march through the street. East scatter, shopkeepers stand in their doorways. The two Bennett girls simper at the hands of the young soldiers. Mrs. Bennett, flushed and excited, runs panting behind them. Lydia deliberately drops her handkerchief. One of the soldiers stands on it. She's appalled. <laughs> Interior drawing room, another field evening. Lizzie is reading a book. Darcy is writing a letter. Bingley is sat nervously. Caroline, obviously bored, wanders the room looking for distraction. She looks over Darcy's shoulder. You write uncommonly fast, Mr. Darcy. You are mistaken. I write rather slowly. Caroline lingers, annoyingly. How many letters you must have occasion to write, Mr. Darcy? Letters of business, too. How odious I should think them. Fortunate, then, that they fall to my lot instead of yours. Please, tell your sister that I long to see her. I have already told her once, by your desire. Lizzie looks across from her book. I do dote on her. I was quite in raptures at her beautiful little design for a table. Perhaps you will give me leave to defer your raptures till I write again? At present, I have not enough room to do them justice. Mr. Bingley now pacing anxiously around the room. It's amazing how young ladies have the patience to be so accomplished. What do you mean, Charles? They all paint tables and embroider cushions and play the piano. I never heard of a young lady, but people... What, what people say she is accomplished. The word is indeed implied too liberally. 
I cannot boast of knowing more than half a dozen women in all my acquaintances ever that are truly accomplished. Nor I, to be sure. Goodness, you must comprehend a great deal in the idea. I do. Absolutely. She must have a thorough knowledge of music, singing, drawing, dancing, and the modern languages to deserve the word. And something in her air and manner of walking. And, of course, she must improve her mind by extensive reading. Lizzie closes her book. I am no longer surprised at your knowing only six accomplished women. I rather wonder now at your knowing any. Are you so severe on your own sex? I never saw such a woman. She would certainly be a fearsome thing to behold. Pause. Darcy goes back to his letter. Caroline picks up a book, pauses, puts it down. She walks over to Lizzie. Miss Bennet, let us take a turn about the room. Lizzie, surprised, gets up. Caroline links her arm and they start walking up and down. It's refreshing, is it not? After sitting so long in one attitude. And it's a small kind of accomplishment, I suppose. Darcy uh, meets Lizzie's eye, briefly. He doesn't know how to cope with the idea that she's laughing at him. Caroline turns to Darcy. Mr. Darcy, will you join us? You can only have two motives, Caroline, and I would interfere with either. What can he mean? Our surest way of disappointing him will be to ask nothing about it. Please tell us. Either you are in each other's company and have secret affairs to discuss, or you are conscious that your figures appear to do the greatest advantage by walking. If the first, I should get away. If the second, I can admire you much better from here. Oh, shocking. How shall we punish him for such a speech? Oh, we could always laugh at him. Oh, no. Mr. Darcy is not to be teased. Are you too proud, Mr. Darcy? And would you consider pride a fault or a virtue? That I couldn't say. Because we're doing our best to find a fault in you. Maybe it's that I find it hard to forgive the follies and vices of others or the offenses against myself. My good opinion, once lost, it seems, is lost forever. Oh dear. Well, I cannot tease you about that. What a shame, for I dearly love to laugh. Family trait, I think. Lizzie smiles sweetly. Caroline glances at Darcy, expecting to have triumphed, but he's just looking put out. Interior, Jane's bedroom, Netherfield morning. Jane is asleep in bed. Lizzie is awake in a small cot bed next to Jane. She gets up. Exterior, countryside, morning. Darcy gallops to the countryside, still looking put out. <laughs> Exterior, back lawn to parkland, Netherfield morning. Lizzie stands on the edge of the formal garden, looking out onto the rustic parkland. Suddenly, Darcy emerges over the crest of a hill and gallops toward his house. He pulls the horse to a halt as he sees Lizzie. With his wet hair flattened against his forehead and his face soaked in sweat, he looks for a second like a mysterious and beautiful boy. He locks eyes for a brief moment before Lizzie turns in a shiver and walks away. Interior, Jane's bedroom, Netherfield morning. Lizzie enters the room and goes to Jane's bed. Jane is waking up. Jane, do you think you might feel well enough to leave today? Interior, drawing room, Netherfield day. The door is open. The footman, as before. A Mrs. Bennet. A Miss Bennet a Miss Bennet, and a Miss Bennet, sir. <laughs> Are we to receive every Bennet in the county? Mrs. Bennet, Lydia, Mary, and Kitty are introduced to Caroline Bingley and Darcy. Lizzie holds her breath as her mother launches into familiar form. What an excellent room you have, sir. Such expensive furnishings. Oh, my county. please. I hope you intend to stay here, Mr. Bingley. Absolutely. I find the country very diverting. Don't you agree, Darcy? Uh, I find it perfectly adequate, even if society is a little less varied than in town. Less varied? Not at all. We dine with four and twenty families of all shapes and sizes. So William Lucas, for instance, is a very agreeable man. A good deal less self-important than some people of half his rank. Lizzie cringes. Mr. Bingley, is it true 
that you have promised to hold a ball here at <laughs> Netherfield, it would be an excellent way to meet new friends. You can invite the militia. They're an excellent company. <laughs> hand, hand, wink, wink. <laughs> you hold a ball. Kitty. When your sister has recovered, you shall name the day. I think that a ball is a perfectly irrational way to gain a new acquaintance. It would be better conversation instead of dancing for the order of the day. Indeed, much more rational, but rather less like a ball. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> Please, let me show you to Jane. You will find her quite recovered. Exterior drive, Netherfield day. The Bennett's carriage awaits. The Bingleys are gathered to see the Bennett's off. Jane is radiant in the peak of health that only love brings. I don't know how to say Bingley beams bashfully. You're welcome anytime you feel the least bit poorly. I mean, you're welcome at any time, but not any less welcome if, you know, you're... He hands her into the carriage, still babbling. Jane remains demure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for such stimulating company. It has been most instructive. Not at all. The pleasure is all mine. Lucy looks at Darcy, who bows wordlessly. Mr. Darcy? Miss Bennet. Maintaining his glacial exterior, Darcy moves forward, and before Bingley can do so, hands Lizzie into her carriage. She gives him a surprised glance as her hands meet, and then unaccountably blushes. Bingley starts to wave violently as the carriage draws off. Darcy turns without a second glance. Caroline watches him narrowly. Goodbye! Goodbye! Into your carriage, leaving Netherfield the same. The family are all squeezed in rather too tightly. What a high and mighty man that Mr. Darcy is. Quite eaten up with pride. Lizzie's still confused by a touch of his hand and frowns to herself. Exterior country road day. The Bennett's carriage is stopped in its tracks by a company of the militia who are crossing the road in front of them interior carriage country road day a few of the soldiers look in at the bennett girls with some interest leading them is flip a very handsome blonde officer lydia spots him and swoons oh, i can't believe it i can't believe it they're close enough to touch <laughs> just reach at me oh oh see the blonde oh be still my beating heart oh thomas can't you drive around them to a loud protest from Lydia and Kitty, the carriage veers off. No! <laughs> Interior at Longbourn, Hearts for Shire, day. As the Bennett girls come into the house, Lydia, oh wow. Eulogizing. 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 Lydia eulogizing the militia, they meet Mr. Bennett. Oh, there was one with great long lashes, like a cow. Did you see him? Oh, he looked right at me. Ooh. Lydia just called the militia a cow. <laughs> <laughs> she did. <laughs> I hope, my dear, that you have ordered a good dinner today, because I have reason to expect an addition to our family party. Mr. Bennett holds up a ladder. Interior carriage coming through Meriton Day. Mr. Collins, late 20s, is an overweening silk... Sick sick of fan. Fan. Sick of fan. Fan. Yonakata, yonak, oh my gosh, I hate this. Unctious. In equal measure, sits in his black garb, hunched uncomfortably as he comes through town. The disagreement over the embezzlement of Longbourn estate has been subject to <laughs> torment, which I wish to feel. Uh, having received orientation this day, uh, Easter after being so fortunately distinguished by Catalan and the Red <laughs> Lady Catherine de Burns. We're gonna have to add subtitles. We're gonna have to add subtitles. <laughs> Mr. Collins' voice fades out as his carriage whites the, through the frame, revealing Lizzie and Charlotte on the way to the butchers. His name is Mr. Collins. He's the dreaded cousin. Who's to inherit? Indeed. Everything, apparently. He may leave us our stays, but even my piano stool belongs to Mr. Collins. When? Oh, he can turn us out of the house as soon as he pleases. But why? 
because the estate is entailed to him and not to us poor females. The cart passes. Cranberry sheep go into the slaughter. They bob plentifully. Enter <laughs> 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 uh, hallway, longborn day. Mr. Collins ushered in by a manservant, Giles. He looks around at his future home with interest. Mr. and Mrs. Bennett greet him. Mr. Collins, at your service. In your dining room, Longbourn evening. The Bennett's and Mr. Collins are seated formally for supper. The Mr. Collins is served some food. Wow, what a um, superbly featured room. And what excellent boiled potato. <laughs> With a uh, <laughs> It's been many years since I have served such exemplary vegetable. To which of my dear cousins should I compliment the excellence of the cooking? Mr. Collins, we are perfectly capable, able to keep a cook. Oh, what a blessing. Uh, <laughs> I'm honored to have as my favorite Lady Cassidy Bird. As you have heard of her, I presume? Mrs. Bennett shakes her head. My small rectory abutes her estate, Rosings Park, and she often condescends to drive to my humble dwelling <laughs> in her little satan and ponies. A pause. Lizzie catches his father's eye. Does she have any family? Oh, one daughter. The heiress of the tall and a creature of such superior graces. She seems born to greatness. <coughs> These are, are the kind of little delicate compliments that are always acceptable to ladies. And which I consider myself particularly bound to pay. <laughs> How happy for you, Mr. Collins, to possess the talent for flattering with such delicacy. Mm, yes, Mr. Collins nods with satisfaction. Do these pleasing attentions proceed from the impulse of the moment, or are they res the result of previous study? Jane kicks Lizzie under the table. Lizzie tries not to laugh at Mr. Collins' answer. Oh, babe arise from what from what is passing at the time and though i sometimes assume myself with arranging yes. such little elegant compliments uh, i i always wish to give them unstudied and an air as possible oh believe me no one would suspect your manners to be rehearsed Lydia suddenly lets off a little explosion of hysteria. A fierce look from Lizzie quells it, and Kitty pats her on the back solicitously. After dinner, I uh, thought I might read to you all for an hour or two. I have with me Lord Dice's sermon, which I speak eloquently on all matters more. You know, Mr. Lord Dice's sermon, Miss Bennett. Interior, corridor, drawing room, long bore, later. We can see the girls and Mr. Bennett gathered by the fire through the doorway. Mr. Collins leaves the room and takes Mrs. Bennett aside to a very discreet conference out of hearing of anyone else. Mrs. Bennett, do you know I have been bestowed by the good grace of a personage of no mean size? I have become aware of the fact. Well, um, it is my avowed hope that I soon may find a mistress for it, and I have come to inform you that the eldest Miss Bennett has captured my special attention. <laughs> Mr. Collins looks lavish, lasciviously into the room. Mr. Collins, unfortunately, it is incumbent on me to hint that the eldest Mrs. Bennett is very soon to be engaged. Engaged? But Miss Lizzie, next to her in both age and beauty, would make anyone an excellent partner. Do you not agree, Mr. Collins? Mr. Collins looks through the doorway at Lizzie. Oh, um, indeed, yes, indeed, a very agreeable 
Oh, thrown it in. Exterior back garden, meadow, longborn day. Mr. Collins appears through a door to the yard. He spots Jane and Lizzie and advances towards them. No, no, quick, this way. She pulls Jane across the duckboard spanning the moat. Mr. Collins comes out in the back garden. The girls are nowhere to be seen. He looks around puzzled as we reveal Lizzie and Jane hiding behind the moat wall. Exterior American Village Day. Lizzie, holding Jane's hand, is still running and laughing as she goes. Jane is grumbling, holding onto her bonnet. Don't do something, I've got no more bread. Lizzie slows, turning around to laugh at Jane, then turning back and practically winding the tall, blonde officer spotted earlier by Lydia. He stands before her, holding a handkerchief he's fluttered mm. from her sleeve, a witty curl on his exquisite mouth. Lizzie is, for a moment, speechless, but then nods and takes the kerchief from Kitty as Kitty and Lydia rush up from behind Wickham. Yours, I believe. Oh, shoot. Glory's not back. <laughs> well... Yours, I believe. Lizzie is, for a moment, speechless, but then nods and takes a kerchief as Kitty and Lydia rush up from behind Wickham. Oh, how perfect you are, Mr. Wickham. You picked up my glove, too. Did you uh, drop yours on purpose, Lizzie? Mr. Wickham's a lieutenant. An enchanted lieutenant. Mm. What are you up mm. to, Lee? This happened to be looking for some ribbon, I Wait. For the ball. Well, sh shall we all look for some ribbon together? Mm -hmm. Wickham's wry tone tells Lizzie that he perfectly understands her silly sisters. Interior Milner's shop day. They come to the shop. The others go towards the counter. Wickham hangs back and smiles a complicit, witty smile at Lizzie. I shan't even browse. I can't be trusted. I have a very poor taste in ribbons. Only a man truly confident of himself would admit that. No, it's true. And buckles. And when it comes to buckles, I'm lost. Dear, oh dear, you must be the shame of the regiment. A laughing stock. <laughs> what do your superiors do with you? I ignore me. I'm of next to no importance. So it's easily done. On the contrary, Wickham is almost impossible to ignore. Lizzie tears her eyes from his winsome features as Lydia grabs her sleeve. Lizzie, Lizzie, can you lend me some money? You already owe me a fortune, Lydie. Uh, allow me to oblige. No, please, Mr. Wickham. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, sir. This shop is cash or checks only. <laughs> Wickham gives Lizzie a smile and moves away to the counter. Exterior road to Marathon Day. Wickham is escorting the girls home. He's scything down cow parsley with his sword as Lydia and Kitty wave yards of ribbon about. It's impossible not to admire the cut of Wickham's jib as he darts athletically about the undergrowth. Lizzie is almost as fizzy as her sisters. Jane watches them all with her benevolent smile. Take that, you cur, and that, and that. More cow parsley bites the dust. <laughs> I pity the French. Oh, so do I. Miserable bunch. Small, swarthy, and that tiny emperor. Lizzie laughs. Look, Mr. Bingley. Mr. Bingley and Darcy are riding towards them. Bingley pulls in his horse, jumps down, and hurries over, his open, friendly face filled with delight. Darcy stays astride, staring at Wickham, who suddenly sheathes his sword and looks at the ground. Lizzie watches him. His eyes dart up to Darcy and away again. Darcy's face is dark and closed. I was on my way to your house. Mr. Bingley, how do you like my ribbons for your ball? Bingley is gazing at Jane. Very beautiful. Oh, she is. Look at her. She's blooming. But Lydia dances around Bingley, waving her ribbons in his face. Be sure to invite... <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Now be sure to invite Mr. Wickham. He's a credit to his profession. Darcy turns and rides off without a word. Lizzie watches, fascinated as Wickham recovers himself. Lydia, you can't invite people to other people's balls. Of course, you must come, Mr. Wickham. Ladies, excuse me, enjoy this. Bingley bows principally to Jane and jumps back on his horse. Lizzie turns to Wickham, but he's already walked ahead. The mood of the day has changed completely, and Lizzie starts to follow him, thoroughly puzzled. 
Exterior road to marriage and day. Rather tired after a strenuous flirting, Lydia and Kitty have linked arms with Jane and are moaning about the walk as they pass us. Uh, I feet hurt. Oh, I hate this walk. It's always too far. Nearly there. Lizzie uh, is looking next to Wickham, who is looking depressed. Will you come to Netherfield Bowl then, Mr. Wickham? Ah, uh, perhaps. How, how long has Mr. Darcy been a guest there? About a month. Forgive me, but are you acquainted with him, with Mr. Darcy? Indeed. I have been connected with his family since infancy. Lizzie is genuinely surprised. You may be well surprised, Miss Bennett, especially <laughs> given our cold greeting this afternoon. I hope your plans in favor of Meriton will not be affected by your difficult relations with the gentleman. Oh no, it is not for me to be driven away. If he wishes to avoid seeing me, he must go, not I. Pause. I must ask you, Mr. Wickham, what is the manner of your disapproval of Mr. Darcy? Do you really want to hear? Lizzie tries not to nod too vehemently. He ruined me. She stares at him. How so? My father managed his estate. We grew up together, Darcy and I. His father treated me like a second son. Oh, he was the kindest of men and bequeathed me the best living in his gift for I had a, my heart set on joining the church. But when he died, Darcy ignored his wishes and gave the living to another man. Why did he do that? Out of jealousy, for his father loved me more than he loved him. Cruel, cruel, are you sure? And out of pride, for he considered me too lowly to be worth his consideration. Pause, Lizzie gazed at him with horror and sympathy. Interior Kitty and Lydia's bedroom, Longbourn Day. We pan through the bedrooms as the Bennett girls prepare for the Netherfield Ball. Betsy is helping Lydia and Kitty into their dresses. They are both wearing white. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> He's not murdering you. <laughs> Have you tried wearing a corset? I know, that's, that's debatable. Breathe in. Interior Lizzie and Jane's bedroom, Longbourn Day. We move to the quieter preparations of Jane and Lizzie. Jane has taken the curlers out of Lizzie's hair. We have never seen Lizzie pay such attention to her appearance. I still think there must have been a misunderstanding. Oh, Jane, do you never think ill of anybody? How could Mr. Darcy do such a thing? I will discover the truth from Mr. Bingley from the ball this evening. If it is not true, let Mr. Darcy contradict it himself. But until he does, I hope never to encounter him. Oh, unfortunate Mr. Wickham. On the contrary, he is twice the man Darcy is. And let us hope a rather more willing dancer. Jane leaves Lizzie at the mirror, taking very particular care of her toilet. Toilet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Exterior, interior, another field dusk. A long key was formed to gain entrance to the ball. There are hundreds of guests. All the women are dressed in shades of off-white. Men are either in red officer uniform or dressed in black and white. We move up the queue to the front door. Bingley and Caroline are greeting their guests. The Bennets are next in line to step up. Bingley, Beans, and Jane. You're here. I'm so pleased. And so am I. <laughs> How are you, Miss Elizabeth? Lizzie is not paying attention. Instead, she is searching over Mr. Bingley's shoulder for a sight of Wickham. Are you looking for someone? No, not at all. Admiring the general splendor. It is breathtaking, Mr. Bingham. The Bennets are forced to move on to the house. Mrs. Bennet talks while we focus on Lizzie searching the sea of red coats. I dare say I have never met a more pleasant gentleman in all my years. Did you see how he dotes on her? Dear, dear Jane, always doing what is best for her family. Lizzie slips away into the next room. She walks into the dining room, which has been converted into a ballroom and where numerous couples are dancing while others crowd the edges to watch. Lizzie thinks she sees Mr. Wickham among the dancers. She moves to get a clearer view. The man turns round, but is not Wickham. Charlotte approaches her through the crowd. Have you seen Mr. Wickham? Charlotte shakes her head. Perhaps he's through here. 
Interior, another field of drawing room nights. Lizzie and Charlotte enter the drawing room. Jane appears and catches Lizzie's arm. He's not here, apparently otherwise detained. The disappointment is palpable. Detained? Mr. Collins arrives breathless. He smiles eagerly at Lizzie. They own you all! Mr. Collins, what a pleasant surprise. Oh, yes, um, perhaps you will do me the honor, Miss Lizzie. Oh, I didn't think you danced, Mr. Collins. I do not consider it incapable with office of clergyman to indulge in such an innocent diversion. Lizzie tries to smile politely. Oh, also, in, <laughs> in fact, <laughs> in fact, let me go on. I have more to say in this matter. In fact, uh, several people, her ladyship included, have complimented me on my lightness of foot. <laughs> Lizzie's smile congeals. Interior, living or er, dining room, ballroom, Netherfield night. Lizzie dances with Mr. Collins. The style of dancing is not unlike English country dancing. To be sure, dancing is a little complicated to me, <laughs> but it, uh, but it does afford the opportunity to ravish one partner with delicate attention, which is my primary object this evening. <laughs> Lizzie turns as part of the dance, and for a moment, she dances beside Jane. Apparently, you're Mr. Wickham, who has been called some business town. Though my informer told me he would have been less inclined to be engaged had it not been for the presence at Netherfield of a certain gentleman. Jane indicates toward where Darcy stands watching them. That gentleman barely warrants the name. The dance leads Lizzie back to Mr. Collins. It is of my intention, if I may be so bold, to remain close to you throughout the evening. Interior staircase, Netherfield night. Lizzie and Charlotte come out of the drawing room laughing and run straight into Mr. Darcy. May I have the next dance, Miss Elizabeth? Lizzie is stunned. You may. Darcy walks away. Did I just agree to dance with Mr. Darcy? I dare say you will find him very amiable, Lizzie. Which would be most inconvenient since I have sworn to loathe him for all eternity. Interior, dining room, ballroom, netherfield, night. Lizzie dances face to face with Darcy. Neither can speak. They dance for a moment in silence. I love this dance. <laughs> Indeed, most invigorating. They continue for a moment in silence. It is your turn to say something, Mr. Darcy. I talked about the dance. Now you ought to remark on the size of the room or the number of couples. I'm perfectly happy to oblige. Please advise me of what you would like most to hear. Well, that reply will do for the present. Perhaps by and by, I may observe that private balls are much pleasanter than public ones. But for now, we may be silent. Do you talk as a rule while dancing? No, no. I prefer to be unsociable and taciturn. That makes it all so much more enjoyable, don't you think? Darcy ponders this critique of his social skills a moment. Tell me, do you and your sisters very often walk to Meryton? They are suddenly parted by the choreography of the dance. We stay with Lizzie, who is whisked around the floor by an elderly man who smiles at her toothlessly. Lizzie looks back at Darcy, who is dancing with Lydia. He stares at Lizzie as he dances. Lizzie smiles at her current partner in embarrassment. Very mild weather we've been having. I prefer them soft boiled. <laughs> <laughs> the dance spins again as she is back with Darcy. Yes, we often walk to Meryton. It is a great opportunity to meet new people. In fact, when you met us, we had just had the pleasure of forming a new acquaintance. Mr. Wickham is blessed with such a happy manner to be sure of making friends. Whether he is capable of making then is the best certain. Oh, he has been so unlucky as to lose your friendship, and I dare say that is an irreversible event. It's Darcy's face is closing up, but he can't help himself. Why do you ask such a question? To make out your character, Mr. Darcy. Mm, very little. The dance finishes. 
I hear such different accounts of you as puzzle me exceedingly. I hope to afford you more clarity in the future. They bow to each other, tension between them almost palpable. Lizzie moves quickly away, deeply unsettled. A breathless Mr. Collins appears. Oh my! <laughs> He's so very, he's so toasty. Remember him, Bobby Shires? I believe so. But I must make myself known to him immediately. Uh, but, sir. He is a nephew of my assumed. Take from this lady Catherine. He is. Mr. Collins starts making his way determinedly towards Darcy. Please, Mr. Collins, he'll consider it an impertinence. Lizzie watches from a distance with acute embarrassment as Mr. Collins interrupts Darcy. Darcy does not notice him, so Mr. Collins raises his voice. Mr. Darcy! <laughs> the room around him stops. Darcy is surprised and turns around. The dumb show we see during the conversation, Mr. Collins points Lizzie out to Darcy, who looks horrified by Mr. Collins' obsequiousness. obsequiousness. Caroline sidles up to Lizzie. What? Interesting relatives you have, Miss Bennet. Lizzie walks away into another room. Interior, another field night. Montage. A blurry vision of the goings-on as the night passes. Kitty and Lydia are giggling insanely. Mary singing badly. <laughs> Mrs. Bennett tipping a glass of punch over someone. Mr. Bennett snoozing behind her. <laughs> Mrs. Bennett watching Jane and Bingley. Darcy passes her behind her and hears. Oh, yes. We fully expect a most advantageous marriage. Bingley staring at Jane, who sits demure as ever, watching a dance. Elizabeth and Charlotte watch Jane. She should move fast. Snap him up. There's plenty of time to get to know th them after you're married. Caroline dancing with Darcy. She chats on. He is silent. Mr. Collins following Lizzie about like some duckling. Lizzie escaping onto the terrace and trying to calm down and breathe. Scene deleted. Interior <laughs> entrance hall. Another field. The wee hours. Daylight creeps in through the curtains. Lydia and Kitty have dragged the last surviving fiddle player into the hall and propped him against the door frame. He now plays as they dance with each other. Mrs. Bennett is sprawled on the sofa. Jane is sitting demurely. Collins looking longingly at Lizzie. Bingley is standing, the perfect host, but obviously willing the Bennets to leave. Mrs. Bennett holds court. I have never had such a good time in my life, Mr. Bingley. You must have such a ball once a month at least. Oh, my please. Caroline, who is standing with her brother, yawns ostentatiously. Mother, I really think it is time to go. Don't be impertinent. Our hosts are perfectly happy with our company. Are you not, Mr. Bingley? I hope I can entice you to Longbourn to sample our hospitality. We would make sure you have three or four courses at least. Oh, my please. She holds out her glass for a top up and carries on. So, tell me, Mr. Bingley, whom did you like least of all your guests this evening? Oh, my, County. please. Really, this is enough. Darcy is looking down at Lizzie from the staircase. He turns and walks away. Exterior, another field drive, part for Shire, for Shire morning. Bingley and Caroline are waving off the Bennett carriage. Bingley is gray with fatigue. Caroline looks at his plentitive expression and then at the departing carriage. My dear Charles, you can't be serious. Bingley shoots her a look and goes into the house in a huff. We will be having a wedding here at Netherfield in less than three months, if you ask me, Mr. Bennett. Mr. Bennett! Interior breakfast room, long boring day. The Bennetts eat in silence. Jane yawns. Mrs. Bennett, Bennett moans. She is hungover. Mr. Collins comes in in a state of agitation. They look at him. He sits, hesitates, then asks. Miss Bennett. I was hoping, if it not to trouble you, that I might consolidate a private audience uh, with Miss Lizzie in the course of the morning. Lizzie is open-mouthed. Oh, yes, certainly. Lizzie would be very happy indeed. Mm. Everyone, out. Mr. Collins would like a private audience with your sister. Everyone looks in amazement. Wait! Uh, I beg you, Mr. Collins can have nothing to say to me that anybody need not hear. No, nonsense, Lizzie. I desire you will stay where you are. Everyone else, to the drawing room. Mr. Bennett? But now what? Mrs. Bennett whooshes everyone out, winks at Collins, then shuts the door before Lizzie has time to do anything. Lizzie looks at Mr. Collins, who looks at her earnestly. There's a horrible pause and intense embarrassment. <laughs> Dear Miss Elizabeth, 
I am sure my intentions have been too much to be mistaken. Almost as soon as I entered the house, I singled you out as the companion of my future life. Lizzie stares at him, astonished. But before I run away with my feelings, perhaps I may state my reasons for marrying. Firstly, that is the duty of a clergyman to set the example of matrimony in his parish. Secondly, that I am convinced that in, it will add greatly to my happiness. And they are the way. That is, that the urging of my esteem, the patron of Lady Catherine, the ball, that I select. Anyway. We hear a kick and case great from behind the door. Oh, my object in coming to London was to choose such a one from Mr. Bennett's daughters. For I am to inherit the estate of the alliance will surely suit everyone. And now, nothing remains for me but to assure you, in the most animated language of the violence of my affection. Mr. Collins. And that no report on the subject of fortune will cross my lips once we are married. You are too hasty, sir. You forget that I have made no answer. I'm and when I speak to her of your modesty, economy, and other amiable qualities. Sir, I am honored by your proposal, but regret I must decline it. I, I know ladies don't seek to seem too eager. Mr. Collins, I am perfectly serious. You could not make me happy, and I'm convinced I'm the last woman in the world who can make you happy. I flatter myself, cousin, that your refusal is merely a nature of delicacy. I know, I can know what I'm saying. And as it is by no means certain that another offer you marriage may ever be made to you. <laughs> Mr. Collins! I must conclude that you simply seek to increase my love, my suspense, according to the usual practice of elegant female. Sir, I am not the sort of female to torment a respectable man. Please understand me, I cannot accept you. Lizzie storms out of the room and out of the house. Mrs. Bennett crashes through and the door, hot on the tail of Lizzie. Oh, headstrong, foolish child! Don't worry, Mr. Collins, we shall have this little hiccup dealt with immediately. Mrs. Bennett goes after Lizzie. Mr. Collins watches through a window as Lizzie is pursued by her mother. Interior library, Longbourn the same. <sighs> Mrs. Bennett marches into the library. Mr. Bennett looks up in shock. Oh, Mr. Bennett, we are all in an uproar. You must come and make Lizzie marry Mr. Collins, for she vows she will not have him. Mr. Bennett stares at Mrs. Bennett blankly. Mr. Collins has proposed to Lizzie, but Lizzie declares she will not have him, and now the danger is Mr. Collins may not have Lizzie. But what am I to do? Mrs. Bennett drags Mr. Bennett to his feet. Speak to Lizzie. They march to find Lizzie, passing Mr. Collins in the dining room. Interior drawing room, Longbourn the same. Mr. and Mrs. Bennett confront Lizzie, who has been waiting in the drawing room. Perhaps the other girls form an audience uh, from the stairs. Mr. Collins looks sheepishly from the breakfast room. Tell her that you insist upon them marrying. Papa, please. You will have this house. I can't marry him. You will save your sisters from destruction. I can't. Go back now and say that you've changed your mind. No. Think of your family. You can't make me. Mr. Bennett, say something. So, your mother insists on you marrying Mr. Collins. Yes, or I shall never see her again. 
Well, Lizzie, from this day on, you must be a stranger to one of your parents. Who will maintain you when your father is dead? Your mother will never see you again if you do not marry Mr. Collins. And I will never see you again if you do. Mr. Bennett. Thank you, Papa. Lizzie turns around and walks into the hall. Interior hall stairs is long born the same. Lizzie walks through the other sisters who gather at the door, but stops when she reaches Jane sitting on the stairs. Her face is white. There's a letter in her hand. Mrs. Bennett charges out and speaks to anyone who will listen. Oh, ungrateful child, I shall never speak to her again. Not that I have much pleasure in talking to anyone. People who suffer as I do from nervous complaints can have no inclination for talking. Nobody can tell what I suffer. She jabbers on her voice fades. We're with Jane, rereading the letter. What's wrong, Jane? Close on Jane's pale face. She's staring at the letter. But it is always so. Those who complain are never pitied. Interior carriage, leaving Netherfield the same. Bingley, Caroline, and Darcy sit grimly in a carriage as it drives away from Netherfield. Darcy looks severe and stern. Caroline can't help a little smirk in her face. Bingley looks back longingly. Exterior, enter another field day. The footman walks back into the house. Inside, the furniture is being covered with dust sheets. The footman closes the heavy doors. Interior, bedroom, longborn night. Lizzie is packing a case for Jane while Jane sits on the bed. I don't understand. What would take him from Netherfield? Why would he not know when he was to return? I don't mind. Jane passes Lizzie the letter. Mr. Darcy is impatient to see his sister, and we are scarcely less eager to meet her again. I really do not think Georgiana Darcy has her equal for beauty, elegance, and accomplishments. So much so, I must hope to hereafter call her my sister. Caroline sees that her brother is in love with you and has taken him off to persuade him otherwise. But I know her to be incapable of locally deceiving anyone. More likely that he does not love me and never has. Lizzie slams shut the lid of the case with rather more force than is necessary. He loves you, Jane. Do not give up. Go to our aunts and uncles in London. Let it be known you are there, and I am sure he will come to you. External Longbourn Day. Jane is in a carriage. Mrs. Bennett kisses her goodbye through the window. Oh, my County. please. All the Bennetts look on. Give my love to my sister and try not to be a burden, dear. Jane's carriage moves away and then the family wave. Mr. Bennett talks to Lizzie. Poor Jane. However, a girl likes to be crossed in love now and then. It gives her something to think of. And a sort of distinction among her companions. I'm sure that will cheer her up, Papa. Interior bedroom, longborn day. Lizzie is making the bed and tidying Jane's belongings. Dissolve too. Lizzie sits on the bed. There's a knock at the door and Charlotte enters. My dear Lizzie, I've come to tell you the news. Mr. Collins and I are engaged. Oh, shit! Lizzie stands up very suddenly. Engaged? Yes. To be married? Yes, of course, Lizzie. What other kind of engaged is there? Lizzie just stares at her. Charlotte, who's in a state, makes an impatient gesture towards her. Well, for heaven's sake, Lizzie, don't look at me like that. There's no earthly reason why I shouldn't be happy with him as with any other. But he's ridiculous. Hush. Not all of us can afford to be romantic. I've been offered a comfortable home and protection. There's a lot to be thankful for. Charlotte. I'm 27 years old. I'm plain and I have no money and no prospects. I'm already a burden to my parents and I'm frightened. So don't judge me, Lizzie. Don't you dare judge me. Something of a passion, Charlotte leaves the room. Lizzie makes kind of a choking noise in her throat, but she doesn't cry. We hear the sound of the militia drums. Exterior Meriton Day. The militia are leaving Marriston. Hundreds of soldiers and officers in the red coats marching out of the village to the sound of pipes and drums. The villagers are out to bid them farewell. Lydia and Kitty run through the crowd very distraught. They find Lizzie coming in the other direction. <laughs> They're leaving for Britain. I want to die. <laughs> All of them. They got the call this morning. Not a word of warning. Lydia wails. <laughs> I say don't actually will. Lizzie searches the red coats for Wickham. She spots him. He glances across at her. She gives a pathetic wave and he's gone. Lydia and Kitty chase the last of officers. The crowds disappear and Lizzie is left alone. We begin to hear Lizzie reading a letter in a voiceover. Dear Charlotte, I am so glad the house, furniture, neighborhood, and roads are all to your taste. Lizzie's patterns make lonely clopping as she walks away.
Exterior Hunsford Parsonage, Kent Day. Lizzie's carriage arrives at a small, a smallish but charming rectory in Kent. This is Hunsford, Charlotte's new home. She rushes out and greets Lizzie, kissing her nervously. And that Lady Catherine's behavior is friendly and obliging. As for the favor you ask, it is no favor at all. I would be glad to visit you at your earliest convenience. Mr. Collins bows and ushers her in. Welcome to our humble abode. Interior Hunsford Parsonage Day, Mr. Collins carries Lizzie's luggage into the narrow hall. My dear, I think our guest is tired after her journey. My wife encourages me to spend as much time in the garden as possible for my sake and my health. Yes. A beat. Lizzie glanced at Charlotte, who remains impassive. I plan many improvements, of course. I began to throw out a bone flag lime walk. Oh, yes. I flatter myself that any young lady would be so happy to be the mistress of such a house. A tiny nod from Lizzie. She understands perfectly. Interior Charlotte's parlor hunts for a day. Lizzie and Charlotte are at last alone. They sit down in a charming little parlor that faces the front of the house. Charlotte pours out tea. We shall not be disturbed here. This parlor is for my own particular use. Oh, Lizzie, it's such a pleasure to run my own home. Lizzie nods uncomfortably. Charlotte, come here. Charlotte jumps up and rushes to the window. What's happened? Charlotte. Has the pig escaped again? Outside in the lane, Mr. Collins stands, bowing at a carriage. Oh, it's Lady Catherine. Come and see, Lizzie. Lizzie goes to the window, unnerved by her friend's enthusiasm. Mr. Collins rushes back toward the house and talks them through an open window. Great news, great news. We have an invitation to visit Rosings this evening from Lady Catherine Ledeberg. How wonderful. Lizzie tries to feign pleasure. Do not make yourself a lady, dear cousin. About your apparel. Just put on whatever you've brought that's best. Lady Catherine has never been averse to truly humble. Lizzie stares at them both in disbelief. Exterior grounds of Rosings Day. Lizzie, Charlotte, and Mr. Collins walk hurriedly across a bridge towards the great house. The gray building looms ominously above them. It is grand without being elegant. One of the most extraordinary sights in all the years of upwards of 20,000 bones. Interior glazed passage past kitchen, Rosings evening. Mr. Collins leaves Lizzie and Charlotte past a vast, a vast steaming kitchen. Interior salon, Rosings day. The salon at Rosings is spectacularly grand, hideously so. Heavy furniture, rows of servants, the three guests are shown in by the footman. Again, Mr. Collins scrapes the floor with his bow. Your ladyship, Miss the Ball. Lady Catherine is a haughty, officious battle axe. Her daughter, Miss de Beau, is sickly, irritable looking creature. So, you are Elizabeth Bennet. I am, your ladyship. Hmm. This is my daughter. It's very kind of you to ask us to dine, Lady Catherine. Lady Catherine ignores her. The chimney piece alone costs 400 pounds. But Lizzie doesn't hear. Darcy walks into the room, freezes. Another man, Fitzwilliam, is with him. Mr. Darcy, what are you doing here? Mr. Yes, Darcy, I had no idea we would have the honor. A stiff bow from Darcy. He looks at Mr. Collins as if he's something brought in by the dog. He turns to Lizzie, trying to collect himself. I, Miss Elizabeth, I'm a guest here. You know my nephew. <laughs> I can't look at you, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, madam, I had the pleasure of meeting your nephew in Hertfordshire. Hmm. It's William, a much more easygoing chap, introduces himself. Colonel Fitzwilliam, how do you do? He bows. 
Lizzie returns his smile gratefully. They move towards the dining room. Mr. Collins leads towards Lizzie. You know that Mr. Darcy is as good as engaged to Miss LeBron. <laughs> really? Oh, Caroline will be so disappointed to hear that. What a miserable little thing. They should suit each other perfectly. But Charlotte's uneasy smile confirms to Lizzie that she has lost her friend in more ways than one. Interior dining room, Rosings night. The dining room is laid for a very grand dinner. Footmen waiting, thousands of candles. Lady Catherine seats herself at the head of the table. Mr. Collins, you can't sit next to your wife. Get up. Move over there. After an awkward shuffle, Lizzie finds herself sitting next to Darcy. Only her own discomfort prevents her from noticing Darcy is by no means a master of his responses to her. I trust your family is in good health, Miss Bennett? They are. Thank you. My elder sister is currently in London. Perhaps you happen to see her there? I haven't been fortunate enough, no. Lizzie looks at him. He colors slightly. Lady Catherine addresses, addresses Lizzie in a loud voice from the head of the table. Do you play the piano forte, Miss Bennett? A little, ma'am, and very poorly. No. Do you draw? No, not at all. Your sisters, do they draw? Not one. Hmm. Has your governess left you? We never had a governess. Mr. Collins squirms in embarrassment. Darcy watches Lizzie keenly. Hmm. No governess. My daughter's brought up at home without a governess. I never heard such a thing. Your mother must have been quite a slave to your education. No, not at all, Lady Catherine. Hmm. Are any of your younger sisters out in society? Yes, ma'am. All. All? What? <laughs> Five out at once? Oh, very <laughs> odd. And you only the second. The younger ones out before the elders are married? Your younger sisters must be very young. <laughs> yes, my youngest is not 16. But I think it would be very hard on younger sisters not to have their share of amusement because the elder is still unmarried and to be kept back on such a motive. It would hardly encourage sisterly affection. Mm, upon my word, you give your opinion very decidedly for so young a person. Pray, what is your age? With three younger sisters grown up, your ladyship can hardly expect me to own it. Lady Catherine looks astonished. Mr. Oh. Collins shifts in his seat. Lizzie is enjoying herself, and Darcy's having great difficulty concealing his admiration. Interior salon roasting night. Dinner is over, and they're drinking coffee. Darcy moves toward Lizzie, but Lady Catherine interrupts by shouting from her seat. Come, Miss Bennet, and play for us. No, I beg you. Music? It's my delight. In fact, there are few people in England who have more true enjoyment of music than myself, or better natural taste. If I had ever learnt, then I should have been a prodigy. So would Anne, if her health would have allowed her. Lady Catherine, I am not afflicted with false modesty when I say I play poorly. Come, come, Lizzie, her ladyship demands it. Lizzie reluctantly sits down at the piano and starts to play. Lady Catherine takes no notice and talks loudly over the music. How does Georgiana get along, Darcy? She plays very well. Ah, I hope she practices too. No excellence can be acquired without constant practice. I've told Mrs. Collins that. Though you have no instrument of your own, you are very welcome to come to Rosings and play on the piano in the housekeeper's room. Thank you, your ladyship. You would be in nobody's way, you know. In that part of the house, 
Darcy flinches at her bad manners, moves away to the piano where Lizzie is playing. Not that terribly well, it must be said. She's nervous, plays a wrong chord, and then gets angry with herself and focuses. You mean to frighten me, Mr. Darcy, by coming in all your state to hear me. But I won't be alarmed, even though your sister does play so well. I am well enough acquainted with you, Miss Bennet, to know I cannot alarm you, even should I wish it. They eye each other warily. Colonel Fitzwilliam joins them. What was my friend like in Hertfordshire? <laughs> you really care to know. The colonel nods. Prepare yourself for something very dreadful. The first time I saw him at the assembly, he danced with nobody at all, even though gentlemen were scarce and there was more than one young lady who was sitting down without a partner. I knew nobody beyond my own party. True. And nobody can be introduced in a ballroom. Miss William, I need you! Miss <laughs> William moves away. Darcy and Lizzie are alone. Darcy is struggling with his pride, which suddenly gives way. I do not have the talent to convert or sing easily with people I have never met before. Perhaps you should take your aunt's advice and practice. Oh. Darcy, flinches. Oh. Darcy flinches. Lizzie turns away from him and carries on playing. Darcy gazes at the curve of her neck. The interior drawing room hunts for a day. Lizzie is writing a letter in the drawing room. She starts, Dear Jane. The doorbell rings in the background. She thinks nothing of it and continues. The maid opens the door to the drawing room and Mr. Darcy enters. Mr. Darcy. An awkward pause. Please, do be seated. I'm afraid Mr. and Mrs. Collins are gone on business to the village. A pause. What on earth does Mr. Darcy want? He paces up and down. This is a charming house. Uh, I believe my aunt did a great deal to it when Mr. Collins first arrived. I believe so. And she could not have bestowed her kindness on a more grateful subject. Another pause. Mr. Collins uh, seems very fortunate in his choice of wife. He is indeed lucky to have found one of the few sensible women who would have accepted him. Oh. Darcy sits down. Shall I call for some tea? No, thank you. The sound of the front door and voices. Darcy jumps up. Good day, Miss Bennet. It's been a pleasure. He bows to her and leaves. Lizzie sits there, bemused and intrigued. Cut to Charlotte in the hallway, taking off her bonnet. Darcy hurries past her with a swift bow and leaves abruptly. Charlotte gazes after him in surprise. Charlotte heads to the drawing room where she finds Lizzie still sitting, thinking, What on earth have you done to poor Mr. Darcy? I have no idea. Truly, <laughs> she doesn't. <laughs> Interior Huntsford Church Day. Mr. Collins, in his vestments, stands in the pulpit delivering his sermon. Lady Catherine sits in the front row with her miserable-looking daughter and downtrodden governess. Lizzie sits a little way behind Colonel Fitzwilliam. They talk in whispers. How long do you plan to stay in Kent, Colonel? As long as Darcy chooses, I'm at his disposal. Everyone appears to be at his disposal. I wonder he does not marry and secure a lasting convenience of that kind. Fitzwilliam looks at Lizzie, curious about her brittle tone. She would be a lucky woman. Really? <laughs> Darcy is a most loyal companion. From what I heard on our journey here, he recently came to the rescue of one of his friends, just in time. Darcy glances across from the adjacent pew. What happened? He saved the man from an imprudent marriage. Who was that man? His closest friend, Charles Bingley. A silence. Mm -hmm. Did Mr. Darcy give you reasons for his interference? Uh, there were apparently strong obje objections to the lady. What kind of objections? Her lack of fortune? I think it was her family that was considered unsuitable. Oh. So he separated them? I believe so. I know nothing else. Lizzie grows pale. She turns to look at Mr. Darcy. Exterior, Rosings Park, day. Lizzie walks across the park, anywhere. She hardly cares. She's in a turmoil of misery and fury. It starts to rain. Exterior, Summer House, Rosings Park, day. A greasy in the Summer House by the lake. 
The rain is now bucketing down. Lizzie hurries into the summer house and sits down heavily on a bench. A man approaches across the floor. He draws nearer. It's Darcy. Lizzie stiffens. He's hurrying towards her. Sodden, breathless, he comes into the summer house. He is far too agitated to notice her upset face. Miss Bennet, I have struggled in vain, but I can bear it no longer. The past months have been a torment. Pauses. I will speak. Lizzie stares at him in astonishment. He struggles on. I came to Rosings with the single object of seeing you. I had to see you. Me? I fought against my better judgment, my family's expectation. Pause. The inferiority of your birth, my rank and circumstance, all of these things, but I'm willing to put them aside and ask you to end my agony. I don't understand. I love you most ardently. Lizzie stares at him. <clears throat> Please, do me the honor of accepting my hand. A silence. Lizzie struggles with the most painful confusion of feeling. Finally, she recovers. Sir, I appreciate the struggle you have been through, and I'm very sorry to have caused you pain. Believe me, it was unconsciously done. A silence. Gathering her shawl, she gets to her feet. Is this your reply? Yes, sir. Are you laughing at me? No. Are you rejecting me? I'm sure that the feelings which, as you told me, have hindered your regard will help you in overcoming it. Terrible silence as this sinks in. Neither of them can move. At last, Darcy speaks. He is very pale. M might I ask why, with so little endeavor at civility, I am thus repulsed? I might as well inquire why, with so evident a design of insulting me, you chose to tell me that you liked me against your better judgment. If I was uncivil, it was some excuse. Believe me, I didn't mean- But I have other reasons. You know I have. What reasons? Do you think anything might tempt me to accept the man who has ruined, perhaps forever, the happiness of a most beloved sister? Silence. Darcy looks as if he'd been struck across the face. Do you deny it, Mr. Darcy, that you've separated a young couple who loved each other, exposing your friend to the censure of the world for caprice and my sister to its derision for disappointed hopes and involving them both in misery of the acutest kind? I do not deny it. How could you do it? Because I believed your sister indifferent to him. <laughs> indifferent? I watched them most carefully and realized his attachment was much deeper than her. That's because she's shy. Dingley, too, is modest and was persuaded that she didn't feel strongly for him. Because you suggested it. I did it for his own good. My sister hardly shows her true feelings to me. I suppose you suspect that his fortune had some bearing on the matter. No. I wouldn't do your sister the dishonor, though it was suggested. What was? It was made perfectly clear that an advantageous marriage. Did my sister give that impression? No. An awkward pause. There was, however, I have to admit, the matter of your family. Our want of connection. Mr. Bingley didn't vex himself about that. No, it was more than that. How, sir? It pains me to say this, but it was a lack of propriety shown by your mother, your younger sister, even on occasion your father. Forgive me. Lizzie blushes. He has hit home. Darcy paces up and down. You and your sister I must exclude from this. Darcy stops. He's in turmoil. Lizzie glares at him, ablaze. And what about Mr. Wickham? Mr. Wickham? What excuse can you give for your behavior to him? You take an eager interest in that gentleman's concerns. He told me of his misfortunes. Oh, yes, his misfortunes have been great indeed. 
You have ruined his chances, and yet you treat him with sarcasm? So this is your opinion of me. Thank you for explaining so fully. Perhaps these offenses might have been overlooked if your pride had not been hurt. My pride? But by my honesty admitting scruples about our relationship, could you expect me to rejoice in the inferiority of your circumstances? And those are the words of a gentleman? From the first moment I met you, your arrogance and conceit, your selfish disdain of the feelings of others, made me realize that you were the last man in the world I could ever be prevailed upon to marry. Darcy recoils as a slapped, terrible silence. Forgive me, madam, for taking so much of your time. He leaves abruptly. Lizzie watches him stride away through the rain. What has she done? Interior, Huntsford Day. Lizzie comes in soaked to the skin. Charlotte runs to her. Lizzie, I was caught off guard. She starts to laugh. There's a hysterical note to it, and Charlotte bustles her away in some alarm. Interior, bedroom, Huntsford, the same. Charlotte attends to Lizzie, who is changed and is drying her hair a shawl around her shoulders. Shall I call the doctor? No. Charlotte, I shall be quite all right. Please give Lady de Berg my apologies. You must not keep her waiting. Mr. Collins clatters up the stairs. Come on, we shall be late. Charlotte leaves reluctantly and goes downstairs. Cut to Lizzie walks down the stairs, down the upstairs corridor. Interior drawing room, Huntsford, day, night. Pick one. Lizzie is in the drawing room. She looks at a book on the table. It is Fordyce's sermons. She puts it down and walks to the mirror and stares at herself. The daylight moves and fades as seamlessly the scene turns to night. Lizzie puts her face in her hands and rubs it wearily. When she looks up, Darcy is reflected behind her. They stare at each other without speaking. Finally, I came to leave you this. He places a letter on the table behind her. Lizzie does not turn but watches him through the mirror. I shall not renew the sentiments which were so disgusting to you. But if I may, I will address the two offenses you have laid against me. Lizzie cannot bring herself to look at Darcy. She stares at the little imperfections on the surface of the mirror. My father provided Mr. Wickham a valuable living. As Lizzie turns, she realizes Darcy is gone. Darcy's voice carries. But last summer, he unwillingly obtruded on my notice when he connived a relationship with my sister, whom he attempted to persuade to elope with him. His objective was inheritance of 30,000 pounds. She was 15. Exterior, Huntsford Woods, night. Darcy rides recklessly through a thick wood. As to the other matter, that of your sister and Mr. Billingsley, though the motives which govern me may to you appear insufficient, they were in the service of a friend. Interior, drawing room, Huntsford, later night. Lizzie with the letter. Charlotte walks in. Lizzie is shaking. Lizzie. Are you all right? I hardly know. Exterior, back garden, Longburn day. Lizzie arrives back at Longburn. She climbs down from her carriage and looks at the house from across the moat. Lizzie walks around the front of the house. Through a window, she sees Jane sitting quietly alone at her needle. <coughs> she takes a deep breath and enters. Interior, Longburn house day. Mrs. Bennett is taking Lizzie's coat from her. How fortunate you have arrived. Your aunt and uncle are here to deliver Jane from London. How is Jane? She's in the drawing room. Lizzie oh. enters the drawing room. Interior, drawing room, room long burn day. Lizzie and Jane sit together. Sit, or Jane is all smiles, but behind her eyes is a sadness unseen before. Lizzie is equally unable to unburden herself. I'm quite open, okay, Lizzie. If we pass in the street, I would hardly notice. London is so diverting. Oh, Jane. It's true. So much to entertain. What news do you get? Nothing. At least, not much to entertain. Lizzie tries to smile. There's a crash as the younger sisters enter the house. Lydia rushes into the drawing room, crying her eyes out. She's followed by Lydia and Mrs. Bennet. Show Mama. Tell her. Mrs. Forrester has invited me. <laughs> Why didn't she ask me in? Kitty, what's happened? It's because I am better company. Right as Lydia. Uh, oh, I could but go to Brighton. 
Oh, Mom, Tally. please. And more so, because I'm two years older. Lydia looks to Jane. Lydia has been invited to Brighton with the Forsters. A little sea bathing would set me up very nicely. Oh, Mom, Tally. please. I shall dine with the officers every night. Ooh. An anguished wail from Kitty. I cried for two days while Colonel Milliard's regiment went away. I thought I should have broken my heart. Mother, are you all mad? She glares at them, deeply upset by them, by everything. Interior, library, long burn day. Lizzie confronts her father. Please. Papa, don't let her go. Lydia will never be easy until she has exposed herself in some public place or other. And we can never expect her to do it with so little inconvenience as under the present circumstances. If you, dear father, will not take the trouble to check her, she will be fixed forever as the silliest and most determined flirt who ever made her family ridiculous. And Kitty will follow, as she always does. We shall have no peace until she goes. Peace? Is that all you care about? Colonel Forrester is a sensible man and will keep her out of any real mischief, and she is far too poor to be an object of prey to anyone. Father, it's dangerous. I'm sure the officers will find women better worth their while. Let us hope, in fact, that her stay in Brighton will teach her her own insignificance. At any rate, she can hardly grow any worse without authorizing us to lock her up for the rest of her life. Oh my Lizzie god. That, Lizzie gazes at her father. Will nothing touch him? He gives up on Lydia. He gave up on Lydia long ago. For this, just now, she hates him. No wonder our family is treated with contempt. She leaves, tears sting her eyes. Her father looks puzzled at her outburst. Interior kitchen, long burned night. Lizzie is preparing a late supper for Mr. and Mrs. Gardiner. Her aunt and uncle. Mrs. Gardiner is a kindly woman, and Mr. Gardiner talks with a London accent. Mary is also helping. I'm making soup in a saucepan. John. <laughs> <laughs> no. dear, you would be very welcome to accompany us. Oh, yes. We plan to journey to the Peak District. You'd be most welcome. The uncle is Russian, too? <laughs> What are men compared to boxing mountains? Believe me, men are either eaten up with arrogance or stupidity. And if they are amiable, they're so easily led that they have no minds of their own whatsoever. Take care, my love. That seems strongly a bitterness. Lizzie looked at her, surprised at the sting of truth. Interior bedroom, long burn night. Lizzie and Jane lie next to each other in the darkness. Pause. I saw Mr. Darcy when I was in Rosings. Why did you not tell me? Did he mention Mr. Ringley? No, he did not. Interior carriage, Derbyshire day. Sunlight flickers through the trees lining the road. Lizzie has her eyes shut and feels the wind in her face. She opens her eyes. Exterior, Derbyshire day. A ravishing landscape of savage and romantic beauty. Scuttling clouds, mountains, wild rocky outcrops. Lizzie is walking freely, the wind in her hair. As she nears the peak of her promontory, Mr. and Mrs. Gardner are below, making their way towards her. They smile at her. She drives off determined to reach the very top. When she gets there, she stands with arms outstretched, her head back, laughing and breathing. The view is magnificent. She breathes deeply. Interior dining, Lambton Inn night. The Gardeners and Lizzie are eating supper. An air of high spirits. At the table, at the next table, another amiable tourist couple are also tucking into their food. He's been taking the waters at Buxton. Hasn't done him a lot of good. Oh my god, a fly, Tom! Abdelle, Henry, just two miles from here. Close, very close, on Lizzie's face. One of the best houses in the country. Now, aren't you acquainted with the owner, Mr. Darcy? Well, we shall go there tomorrow, Lizzie. I would rather stay here. Stay here? I must own that I'm tired of great houses. All those carpets and curtains. But you liked Hayden. You liked those damask velvet drapes, and you liked- If Pemberley is anything like Mr. Darcy, I am sure I will not be able to bear it. 
Mrs. Gardner looked at Lizzie curiously. Let us not make a fuss. Uh, if the girl does not want to go, there's little point in persuading her. Interior bedroom in night. Lizzie is preparing for bed. The chambermaid fills her washbowl and starts to leave. I hear Pemberley is not far from here. Yes, madam. You see something of the owner, do you, in town? Not for some months, madam. He's still in London, I believe. A pause. Close on Lizzie's face, struggling with profound, irresistible curiosity. Exterior, Pemberley Day. Carriage enters the gates of Pemberley. Lizzie is alert, her eyes bright with curiosity. The parkland is wild and rocky. Deer grays, rooks wheel in the sky. A sense of freedom and liberation. As the carriage drives over the top of a hill, close on Lizzie's face, she gasps. The gardeners gasp. A huge, wide shot of Pemberley House. It's vast, breathtakingly beautiful, set in great boulder-strewn park lands. A mansion built of golden stone, glowing in the sunlight. Imagine being mistress of all this. It is as big as Cheapside. Mm, but less picturesque. Lizzie is lost in admiration. Interior front hall, Pemberley Day. Lizzie and the gardeners are shown in by the housekeeper, Mrs. Reynolds. They pass through the front hall. Interior grand staircase, Pemberley Day. Mrs. Reynolds witters on the description of each room as the party travel the grand staircase. Lizzie falls back as she admires the ex exquisite painted ceiling. Interior Sculpture Gallery, Pemberley Day. Lizzie is apart from the rest of the group as she wanders through the stunning collection of marble sculptures. In the background, we hear the gardeners and Mrs. Reynolds. Is your master much a Pemberley? Oh, not as much as I would wish, sir, for he dearly loves it here. Mm. If he should marry, you might see more of him. Yes, Madarn, but I do not know when that will be. I do not know a lady who is good enough for him. What do you mean? Lizzie stops, confronted by a marble bust of Darcy. They stand face to face, looking at each other. Lizzie listens to Mrs. Reynolds. Oh, I've known Mr. Darcy since he was a boy. He was always a kind and generous person, even then. Not everyone can see it because he does not make it. Not everyone can see it because he does not make a meal of it like a lot of young men nowadays. But he is the most okay, sure. <laughs> and kind hearted man I have ever known. Mrs. Reynolds and the gardeners appear by her side. This is my master, Sir Darcy. Handsome face. Lizzie, it's true lightness of him. Does this young lady know Mr. Darcy? Only a little. And do you not think him a handsome man, Miss? Yes. Yes, I dare say he is. Mrs. Reynolds. <laughs> Mrs. Reynolds moves the gardeners on to another sculpture, but Lizzie stays, staring at Darcy's likeness. And this is his sister, Miss Georgiana. She plays all day long. We realize that in the distance, we have heard music. Are they at home? Lizzie turns to find the gardeners and Mrs. Reynolds have disappeared. She follows them out. Interior, drawing room, Pemberley, the same. Lizzie wanders into the drawing room and starts to the others. The music is louder in this room. She walks to the French windows and looks out. In the bright sunlight, the view of the gardens and valley beyond is exquisite. Suddenly, Lizzie recognizes the tune. Perhaps this is the one she played earlier, but this time is played exquisitely. Ouch. <laughs> there is a door, slightly ajar, in the far corner of the room from where the music seems to be coming. Her curiosity gets the better of her, and she approaches the door. She steals herself a moment, then discreetly peeps in. Through the gap, she sees Georgiana Darcy, a beautiful 16-year-old, playing the piano with, her, with great fluency and passion. Captivated by music, Lizzie stops and listens. A man steps into view. Lizzie strains to see him, but he is obscured by shadows. He approaches Georgiana and puts his hand over her eyes. She immediately stops playing and shrieks uproariously before standing to kiss him. As they embrace, the sunlight hits his face. It's Darcy. He turns and sees Lizzie watching him. For a moment, they both stare at each other, frozen with surprise. Lizzie turns and runs across the room and out through the French doors. Exterior lawn, <laughs> Exterior lawn Pemberley Day. Lizzie runs across the lawn, but is stopped in her tracks by Darcy's voice. Miss Bennet. Darcy catches up with her. They stand, not knowing what to do. I thought you were in London. No. I am not. No. Another silence. Then they both speak at once. We wouldn't have time if we'd known you were here. They stop. 
He gazed at her with great emotion. I'm visiting Davisha with my uncle and aunt. Lizzie sounds about 10 years old. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm visiting Jarvis with my uncle and aunt. <laughs> okay, uh, is that, what, is that what you sounded like at 10? <laughs> uh, and uh, are you having a pleasant trip? Very pleasant. Uh, tomorrow we go to Matlock. Tomorrow? Are you staying at Lambton? Yes, at the Rose and Crown. Another pause. She extends her hand. I'm so sorry to intrude. They said the house was open for visitors. I had no idea. She shakes his hand and starts to walk away. May I see you in the village? Oh no. I'm very fond of walking. Yes, yes I know. Goodbye, Whoa. Mr. Darcy. She hurries away. He gazes after her. Exterior path, peak district day. Now she's out of sight, Lizzie collapses on a stone wall. She's utterly undone. She clutches at herself, trying to draw breath into her winded soul. A herd of cattle pass. She stands and walks in the opposite direction. Interior stairs, dining room, Lambton in night. It's that night. Lizzie comes downstairs for supper and stops. Through a gap in the door to the restaurant, she sees Mr. Darcy talking to her aunt and uncle. I shall send my carriage at noon. After a moment, Darcy leaves and Lizzie approaches the table. Lizzie, I've just met Mr. Darcy. Why didn't you tell us you had seen him? He's asked us to dine with him tomorrow. He was very civil, was he not? Very civil. Not at all like you painted him. Right. Dine with him. There's something pleasing about his mouth when he speaks. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Gardner watches Lizzie's reaction most carefully. You don't mind delaying our journey another day? Lizzie shakes her head dumbly. Particularly wishes you to meet his sister. Sister. Interior library and drawing room, Pemberley Day. A footman escorts Lizzie and the gardeners through the stupendous library. In the drawing room, the sound of a piano playing. Lizzie is filled with trepidation. We can almost feel her heart racing. The footman opens the double doors to reveal the magnificent drawing room. Darcy is there. Darcy's sister, Georgiana, plays the piano. She jumps up and hurries over. My sister, Miss Georgiana. They smile and bob. Georgiana is a friendly, sweet girl. I feel like that we Oh, thank you. Not knowing what to do with this information, Lizzie looks about. What a beautiful pianoforte. My brother gave it to me. He shouldn't have. Yes, I should. Oh, very well then. She's easily persuaded, isn't she not? Darcy and Georgiana smile at each other with affection. Your unfortunate brother once had to put up with my playing for a whole evening. Georgiana turns huge innocent eyes upon Lizzie. But he says you play so well. Lizzie, astounded, looks at Darcy, who gives a small, rather sweet shrug. <laughs> then he has perjured himself most profoundly. Darcy laughs. Ha 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 ha. I said played quite well. Quite well is not very well. I'm satisfied. Georgiana looks between them, intrigued and aware, instinctively, of the enormous attraction between them. Darcy notices and makes an effort to be normal. Your uncle is fond of fishing, I hear. Yes, very. Can you persuade him to borrow a rod this afternoon? For the lake here is very well stocked, and its occupants left in peace for far too long. That is a kindness he will never forget, sir. She smiles gratefully, openly, and Darcy has to look away. <laughs> Only when forced. Lizzie looks at Darcy. They smile at each other, a shy smile, a truth. Exterior Derbyshire, dusk. Darcy is driving Lizzie and the gardeners back to Lambton. The rugged landscape looks even more beautiful and dramatic in the dusk light. Lizzie sits up with Darcy, who holds the reins, while Mr. and Mrs. Gardner sit comfortably in the carriage. Mr. Gardner smiles broadly at the few large fish that lie beside him. It's so beautiful up here. I'll be sorry to leave. Darcy smiles at her. You have been a most gracious host. I'm sure my aunt and uncle will talk of nothing else for days. 
I've recently thought a great deal about how I appear and act to others. Lucia looks at him, a serious last look, as though she wants to record his features properly. It does you credit, sir. Interior, Lampton in Night. What a capital fellow. Thank you so much, Mr. Darcy. Darcy is about to take his leave when the maid brings Lizzie a letter. For you, madam. <laughs> it's from Jane. He rips open the letter. Interior, parlor, Lampton in the same. Mr. and Mrs. Gardner are sitting, looking grim. Darcy is pacing, equally concerned. Lizzie walks in with the letter. She tries to speak, chokes the sob, and walks out again. With great difficulty, Darcy restrains himself from following her. He sits down. Lizzie comes back in. He stands up. She waves the letter about and tries to speak once more, but has to leave the room. Hello. Lizzie comes in again very quickly. No, I'm perfectly well. Truly. She takes a deep breath. Darcy's face is a picture of tender concern. Mrs. Gardner watches him, too. It is the most dreadful news. Lydia has run away with Mr. Wickham. They are gone together from Brighton, Lord knows where. She has no money, no connections. I fear she is lost forever. It's my fault. If only I had exposed Wickham when I should. No, it is my fault. I might have prevented all of it by merely being open with my sisters. Mr. and Mrs. Gardner look at each other perplexed. Has anything been done to recover her? Father has gone to London. But I know very well that nothing can be done. We have not the smallest hope. Would I could help you? Sir, I think it is too late. I'm afraid we must go at once. I will join Mr. Bennett and find Lydia before she ruins the family forever. This is grave news indeed. I will leave you. Goodbye. Darcy pauses at the door, looks back at Lizzie, and then is gone. Exterior, countryside, night. The gardener's carriage racing through the night. Interior, Mrs. Bennet's room, bedroom, long burn day. Lizzie, Jane, Mary, and Kate are gathered around Mrs. Bennet, who is taken to her bed. Why did the forwarder's stirs let her out of their sight? I have always said they were unfit to have charge of her. And now she is ruined. You are all ruined. Who will take you now with a fallen sister? Poor Mr. Bennet will now have to fight the perfidious Wickham and then be killed. He hasn't found him yet, Mama. And the Mr. Collins will turn us out before he is cold in his grave. Not be Our uncle is helping in the search. Lydia must have known this. what this will do to my nerves. Such flutterings and spasms all over me. It is clear Mrs. Bennet is truly suffering. Lizzie strokes her hand. Exterior London Street day. Mr. Bennet walks down a busy London street. He is utterly lost. He stops and stands still against the passing pedestrian traffic. He tries to address a passerby. Excuse me. They ignore him. He tries again. Excuse me. I'm looking for... Mr. Bennet takes out a piece of paper. Interior, stables, barracks, night. Mr. Bennett walks timidly into stables. Steam rises off the horses. Men shout as they labor. It is extremely threatening. Mr. Bennett stops at the threshold, hold gulps. I am... I am looking for Mr. Wickham. Interior, upstairs, long burn day. Lizzie and Kitty are outside Mrs. Bennett's room. From inside, we hear a moan. We are ruined. Ruined. How long is this going to go on for? Don't judge her, Kitty. It is, after all, hardest on her. They walk downstairs. Interior, downstairs, long burn. Same. Lizzie and Kitty walk into the drawing room. Jane and Mary are busying themselves. The difficulty is not knowing anything. It's Papa. Interior, library, long burn, day, continuous. The girls rush into the library. Mr. Bennett slumps at his desk. Who is to fight with them and make him really need to come home? For God's sake, let me be. Lizzie, help me with my boots. Lizzie pulls off his boots for him. I suppose them to be still in London. Where else could they be so well concealed? Oh, Father, I'm so sorry. 
it's been my own doing. You mustn't be too severe on yourself. No, Lizzie. Let me once in my life feel how much I have been to blame. I'm not afraid of being overpowered by the experience. It will pass away soon enough. Interior boarding house, London Day. We move through an attic corridor. Doors on either side lead to the poor overcrowded garrets. Children peer out at us. We reach the door we're looking for. Inside, Lydia and Wickham sit, snuggled close beside the fire in the room. They're eating a meal with relish. Giggling, Lydia feeds him a mouthful. I knock on the door. They freeze, like naughty children. Exterior, garden, long burn day. The girls have a letter. Kitty grabs it from Jane, and Mary grabs it from Kitty. Forced a chance to open it, Jane grabs it from Mary. It's a pop-up. Ah. <laughs> it's an uncle's writing. Mr. Bennett snatches the letter. As it is addressed to me... He tears it open and begins to read, squinting because he has forgotten his glasses. He's found them. Oh, they're Mary? Just wait, I can't make out her script. Lizzie snatches it. Give it to me. Oh, they're Mary? They will be. If father will settle a hundred pounds a year on her. That is Wickham's condition. A hundred pounds? You will agree to this, father. The letter is passed around the other girls. Of course I will agree, but how much your uncle has laid on this wretched man already is anybody's guess. What do you mean, father? No man in his senses would marry Lydia on so slight a temptation as a hundred a year. Ah, I see. See what? Your uncle is very generous. Do you think it's a large sum? Wickham's a fool if he takes her for less than ten thousand pounds. Ten thousand? Interior Mrs. Bennett's bedroom to dining room, long burn day. Close to Mrs. Bennett's face as she springs out of bed, pure triumphant joy. Lydia married and at 15 too. Ring the bell, Kitty. I must put on my things and tell Lady Lucas. Oh, to see her face and to tell the servants they have a bowl of punch. <laughs> the other Bennets are assembled. We should thank our uncle, Mama. And so he should help. He's much richer than us, and he hasn't got any children. Lizzie looks at her mother in perfect astonishment as she gets out of bed. A daughter, married. That's what you think about. When you have five daughters, Lizzie, tell me what else will occupy your thoughts, and perhaps you will understand. You don't know what he's like. Now, where will they live? Pervious Lodge might do. Ashworth is vacant, of course. But it's so far away. I couldn't bear to have her ten miles from me. Before you take any of these houses, Mrs. Bennet, let us be clear. Into one house, she will never be welcome. Mrs. Bennet stares at him. Exterior, carriage, front of the house, long burn day. Lydia's triumphant face. The cat's got the cream. She climbs out of the carriage at Wickham. Her mother kisses her effusively. Mr. Bennet coldly bows. And then we pass Sarah Slim's in her carriage until I took off my glove and let my hand just rest on the window frame so she might see the ring. And then bowed and smiled just like anything. Kitty shrieks with Emmy. Don't actually shriek. Lizzie moves away. She cannot bear it. Wickham catches her eye, but she ignores him. <laughs> what? Wickham catches her eye, but she ignores him. Interior dining room, long burn day. They are taking their seats for dinner. Betsy, the maid, has laid food on the table. Lydia holds up her hand to display her ring to Betsy. Oh, you must all go to Brighton, for that is the place to get husbands. Mm, I hope you have half my good luck. Lydia! Wickham looking uncomfortable. He's talking to the stony-faced Mr. Bennett. I've been enlisted in a regiment in north of England, sir. I'm glad to hear of it. Near Newcastle. We shall travel there next week. Can I come and stay with you? That is out of the question. Cut to Lydia rattling on to Lizzie. Well, Monday morning came and I was in such a fuss. I don't want to hear. There was my aunt preaching and talking away just as if she was reading a sermon. She was horrid unpleasant. Can't you understand why? Well, I didn't hear a word because I was thinking of my dear Wickham. Uh, I longed to know whether he would be married in his blue coat. Cut to Mary turning to Wickham. 
the north of England, I believe, hosts some spectacular scenery. Cut to Lydia burbling onto a stony face Lizzie. And then my uncle was called away from the church on business, and I thought, who is to be our best man if he doesn't come back? Lucky he did come back, or I would have had to ask Mr. Darcy. Mr. Darcy? Oh, I forgot. I should have said a word. Mr. Darcy was at your wedding. He was the one who discovered us. Oh, he knew where to find Wickham, you see. But don't tell anyone. He told me not to tell. Lizzie stares at her. Darcy at her wedding? Mr. Darcy? Oh, stop it, Lizzie. Mr. Darcy's not half as high and mighty as you sometimes. Exterior yard, long burn day. Lydia, croquet mallet in hand, drags her new husband across the lawn. Kitty follows. Come on, Wickham. You've got to play. Play croquet. Play croquet. <laughs> yes. Come on. Wickham has the look of a trapped man. His eyes flicker between the girls with a slightly panicked rhythm. Lizzie comes into the garden, looking for a younger sister. Wickham detaches himself and comes over to her, a rueful smile. I hope we can be even better friends now that we're brother and sister. An attempt at a twinkling smile, but Lizzie is now immune to his charm. She nods briefly. I hear you visited Pemberley, my dear old home. I met Mr. Darcy's sister. Did you like her? Very much. We found a great deal to talk about. A beat. Wickham looks deeply uneasy. He bows and leaves. Lizzie hurries up to Lydia and draws her aside. Why was Mr. Darcy there? Shh, I'm not supposed to tell. Lizzie abandons her pride. She takes Lydia's hand. Please, Lydia, please, please tell me. Because he paid for it. For what? The wedding, Wickham's commission, everything. Everything. Lydia, it's your turn. Lydia moves to go. People kept saying Wickham owed them money. It was so tedious. So Darcy settled his debts. But I don't really like him, do you? Lizzie pulls her back. Why? Why did he do it? I don't know. Do I? Anyway, you're not to tell because it's supposed to be our uncle paid, and he wouldn't have minded paying either because I'm his favorite. I don't think so. Shut up, God. <laughs> she leaves, giggles and shrieks from the other girls. Lizzie looks blank with shock. Exterior, Bingley's house, Mayfair, day. Close on Darcy's grimly determined face. Drawing back, we see that he is walking down a street in Mayfair. Mr. Bingley emerges from his front door, carrying a silver-topped cane. Cut to... Mr. Darcy and Bingley talk in an earnest way as they walk along the street. Bingley looks stunned by what Darcy is relaying to him. We witness the dumb show of Darcy confessing that he has wronged Jane Bennett. Interior, dining room, hall, long burn day. Lydia and Wickham are leaving. Mr. Bennett stands at a distance. Mrs. Bennett sobs as Giles takes out the luggage. Write to me often, my dear. Oh, my please. I hope we'll have the pleasure. He smiles winningly. Lizzie just looks at him. His smile falters, and he turns into the carriage. <sighs> Married women never have much time for riding. My sisters may write to me. They'll have nothing else to do. Oh, there is nothing so bad as parting with one's children. One seems so forlorn without them. Mrs. Bennet is genuinely bereft. Lizzie's about to say something, but thinks better of it, and instead gives her mother a hug. Exterior. Meriton Village Day. Lizzie and Jane are out shopping with their mother and sisters. Their housekeeper, Mrs. Hill, comes out of the butcher shop. Did you hear the news, madam? Mr. Bingley is returning to Netherfield. A stunned silence. Lizzie glances at Jane. She drops her eyes. Mr. Bingley? Mrs. Hill indicates a woman in the butcher shop. Mrs. Hill is ordering pork, for she expects him tomorrow. Tomorrow? Not that I care about it. Mr. Bingley is nothing to us, and I'm sure I never want to see him again. No, we shall not mention a word about it. It is quite certain he is coming. Yes, madam. 
I believe he is alone. His sister remains in town. Mm. Why he thinks we should be interested, I have no idea. Come along, girls. Their mother goes into the draper shop. Jane pauses at the threshold. All right, Lizzie. I'm just glad he comes along because then we must have him. Not that I'm afraid of myself, but I dread other people's remarks. A brave smile. Lizzie is not convinced. They go into the shop. Exterior, Longburn Day. Mr. Bingley rides towards Longburn, a look of slight trepidation in his eyes. Darcy now comes into view, riding alongside him. They cross the moat bridge. Interior drawing room, Longburn Day. <laughs> Mary is practicing her scales. Jane and Lizzie are sitting at their work with their mother. Kitty rushes in. He's here. He's here. He's at the dark door. He's at the... <laughs> He's at the door. Mr. Bingley. Oh my goodness. Everyone behave naturally. Jane completely freezes. Everybody else goes into a fluster. Whatever you do, don't appear overbearing. Kitty looks out through her window. Come with them. Mr. What's his name? The uh, pompous one. Pompous one from before. Lizzie looks through the window at Darcy. Her heart leaps in her mouth. <laughs> Mr. Darcy, indeed. The very insolence of it. What does he think of coming here? Oh, my please. Lizzie returns to her seat. Mrs. Bennett hurries over in to Jane and pinches her cheek. Oh, my please. Stop that racket and sit down. Find yourself some work. Oh, Lord, I shall have a seizure. I'm sure I shall. They sit there, frozen, pretending to sew. The drawing room door opens and Mrs. Hill shows in the two men. They bow. Mr. Bingley smiles warmly at Jane, who blushes. Lizzie glances at Mr. Darcy. His face is strained. Mrs. Bennett is all smiles for Bingley. She ignores Darcy. How very glad we are to see you, Mr. Bingley. There are a great many changes since you went away. Miss Lucas is married and settled, and one of my own daughters, too. You would have seen it in the papers, though it was not put in as it ought to have been. Very short. Nothing about her family. I did hear of it and offer my congratulations. But it's very hard to have Lydia taken away from me. Mr. Wickham has transferred to Newcastle, wherever that is. Thank heaven he has some friends. Mrs. Bennett shoots a frosty glance at Mr. Darcy. This is more than Lizzie can handle. Do you hope to stay long in the country, Mr. Bingley? Uh, just a few weeks for the shooting. <laughs> when you have killed all your own birds, Mr. Bingley, I beg you come here and shoot as many as you like, as please. Thank you. Mr. Bennett will be vastly happy to oblige you and will save all the best of the convoys for you. Excellent. Are you well, Mr. Darcy? Quite well, thank you. Well, I hope the weather stays fine for your sport. I return to town tomorrow. So soon. My Jane looks well, does she not? Oh, my God. She does indeed. Well, I must be going. I uh, suppose, Darcy. Darcy? Darcy can not quite believe it. He gives Bingley a harsh stare. Bingley has not completed his task. It was very pleasant to see you all again, Lizzie, Miss Jane. Bingley can almost not bear to look at Jane in the eyes. He acknowledges all very briefly and bolts for the door. Mrs. Bennett fusses about around him. You must come again, for when you were in town last winter, you promised to take a family to, to di dinner with us. I have not forgotten, you see. At least three courses. Bingley and Darcy take their leave, leaving the Bennets sitting in silence, all looking at one another. Kitty is fit to burst out laughing, Lizzie and Jane horrified by the awkward visit. Exterior, the lane, near Longburn, the same. Bingley is pacing backwards and forwards in despair, muttering to himself. Darcy looks at him in extreme frustration. What were you thinking of? It's as if Bingley has not heard. He keeps pacing up and down. Interior, drawing room, Longburn Day. The family is now spread around the room. Kitty's at the window. Jane and Lizzie are sat close on a sofa. Mrs. Bennett muttering things like, most peculiar to anyone who will listen. Mary plinking out a dreary RP jet or two. Well, I'm glad that's over. We can now meet as indifferent acquaintances. <laughs> oh, yes? 
You do not think Mason Week is to be in danger now. I think you are in great danger of making him as much in love with you as ever. Sorry, though, that it came with Mr. Darcy. Don't say that. Why ever not? Lizzie looks at her sister in anguish. Oh, Jane, I have been so blind. What do you mean? <laughs> the doorbell rings. Um. Is it back? He's come again. A stunned reaction. Cut to. Everyone has regained the same positions. They hear Bingley's voice at the door and he comes, for once, absolutely in control of his facial coloring. I know this is all very untoward, but I would like to request the privilege of speaking with this Jane. They all look at him. He stands his ground, takes another deep breath, and continues steadily. All alone. Everyone? In the kitchen? Immediately. Except you, Jane, of course. Oh, my please. Oh, Mr. Bingley, it is so good to see you again. So soon. She ushers everyone out, but not before squeezing Jane's hand. Now Jane and Bingley are alone. <clears throat> um, first, I have to tell you that I've been un- unagitated and a comprehensive ass. Yeah. Jane starts to speak, but Bingley steps toward her and she stops. Jane starts to speak, but Bingley steps toward her and she stops. Cut to interior, exterior, hallway, long burn the same. Mrs. Bennett, Kitty, Mary, and Mr. Bennett are all jostling for position at the door in order to overhear events for inside. Lizzie is apart from her family. She cannot bear to be there. She walks down the corridor and cuts and out of the house into the garden. Through a window, she sees Bingley on one knee, her eyes fill with tears as she walks away from one from the house. Interior, drawing room, long burn the same. Bingley looks at Jane, desperately worried. A pause. Oh, her. Oh, a hundred times, yes. Mrs. Bennett and the girls throw open the double doors to the drawing room and come crashing in. Bingley and Jane beam at them. Thank the Lord for that. I thought it would never happen. Oh, my, please. Exterior garden and long burn the same. Lizzie sits under a tree. It seems the only sensible thing to do. Exterior countryside overlooking long burn the same. Darcy looks down at long burn. In exterior inter bedrooms, long burn night. Through a window, we see Mrs. Bennett lying in her bed while Mr. Bennett lies fully clothed on top of the bed covers. I am sure they will do well together. Their tempers are much alike. They will be cheated assiduously by their servants and be so generous with the rest, they will always exceed their income. Exceed their income? He has 5000 a year. I knew she could not be so beautiful for nothing. Mr. Bennett looks at her with great affection and with perhaps a memory of the great beauty she once was. She doesn't notice. (laughs) The camera moves because she's still beautiful in her eyes. The camera moves from Mrs. Bennett's bedroom window to Mary's window, where we see Mary reading a corrective book out loud to Kitty, then from her window to Lizzie and Jane's interior, Lizzie and Jane's bedroom night. Jane and Lizzie lie in bed. Can you die of happiness? I'm necessarily ignorant of my being in town last spring. How did he account for it? He thought me indifferent. Unfathomable. No doubt poisoned by his pernicious sister. Bravo! That is the most unforgiving speech you've ever made. Oh, dear. If I could but see you so happy, if there were such another man for you. There is noise outside. Perhaps Mr. Collins has a cousin. <laughs> it's, no, <laughs> it's no less than I deserve. What is that? More noise. It sounds like a carriage. Then a loud banging on the door downstairs. The girls look at each other. Interior, downstairs, long burn night. Mr. Bennett, Mrs. Bennett, and the girls, lit only by candles, have gathered. The door bangs again. Maybe he's changed his mind. <laughs> <laughs> Timidly, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Bennett opens the door, revealing a baleful looking Lady Catherine de Burr. Everyone <laughs> gasps. <laughs> Lady Catherine? Lady Catherine does not acknowledge her, but comes in uninvited, inspecting the assembled company of aghast Bennett's. She waves a dismissive hand towards the girls. The rest of your offspring, I presume. All but one. The youngest has been lately married, your ladyship. 
and my illness was only proposed to yesterday afternoon. Mm, you have a very small garden, madame. Could I offer you a cup of tea, perhaps, your ladyship? Absolutely not! I must speak to Miss Elizabeth alone, as a matter of urgency. Ben and all look at each other, bewildered by this strange turn of events. Interior drawing room, long burn night. Lizzie leads the way into the drawing room, holding a candle. Lady Catherine walks in. The door closes behind them. Lizzie puts the candle down on a small table. They sit, facing each other. You can be at no loss, Miss Bennet, to understand why I am here. But only by the oil lamp, Lady Catherine resembles a flickering ghoul. Indeed, you are mistaken. I cannot account for this honor at all. Miss Bennet, I warn you, I am not to be trifled with. A report of a most alarming nature has reached me that you intend to be united with my nephew, Mr. Darcy. Lizzie stares at her, amazed. I know this to be a scandalous falsehood. They're not wishing to hinder him by possible. I instantly set off to make my sentiments known. Lizzie's spirit rises within her. If you believed it impossible, I wonder you took the trouble of coming so far. To hear it contradicted, Miss Bennet. Hmm. Your coming here will rather be a confirmation, surely, if indeed such a report exists. Do you then? Ignorant of it, has it not been industriously circulated by yourself? I have never heard of it. And you can declare there is no foundation for it? I do not possess equal frankness with your ladyship. You may ask the questions which I may not choose to answer. This is not to be born. Has my nephew made you an offer of marriage? You declared it, your ladyship declared it to be impossible. Let me be understood. Mr. Darcy is engaged, my daughter. Now, what have you to say? Only this. If that is the case, you can have no reason to suppose he will make an offer to me. (laughs) Oh, obstinate girl. This union has been planned since their infancy. Do you think it can be prevented by a young woman of inferior birth and whose own sister's elopement resulted in the scandalously patched up marriage only achieved at the expense of your uncle? Heaven and earth are the shades of Pemberley to be thus polluted. Now tell me once and for all, are you engaged to him? I am not. And will you promise never to enter into such an engagement? I will not, and I certainly never shall. You have insulted me in every possible way and can now have nothing further to say. I must ask you to leave immediately. Good night. Lizzie throws open the door, revealing the family outside. Oh, I have never been thus treated in my entire life. Lady Catherine storms past the family and out into the night. Lizzie is standing, shaking with the excitement of having stood so firmly up for herself. Lizzie, what on earth is going on? Just a small misunderstanding. She walks past them to bed. Lizzie, for once in your life, just leave me alone. Everybody looks shocked by Lizzie's reaction. Interior of Lizzie and Jane's bedroom, long burned night. Jane is fast asleep. Lizzie more awake than she's ever been. She quietly climbs out of bed and creeps out of the room. Interior kitchen, long burn the same. Lizzie sits at the table on her nighty, her father's great coat slung around her shoulders. The candle gutters out. She looks at the green dawn. Exterior long burn dawn. Lizzie creeps out into the garden and wanders through the early morning mist as the sun starts to rise. Exterior countryside, the same. Lizzie has lost track of herself and is walking beyond the long burn grounds. The mist is starting to evaporate, evaporate, and through the departing strands, she sees a figure emerging. She stops, suddenly conscious of herself and frightened. Then she realizes it's Darcy, unshaven, red-eyed, slightly wild-looking, but still Darcy. They both stop and stare at each other for a second. 
I couldn't sleep. Nor I. My aunt. He stops, looking wretched. Yes, she was here. How can I ever make men's for such behavior? After what you have done for Lydia, and for all I know for Jane also, it is I who should be making amends. Darcy looks at her for one deep moment. You must know. Surely, you must know. It was all for you. Lizzie is still as a stone. You are too generous to trifle with me. I believe you spoke of my aunt last night, and it has taught me to hope as I had scarcely allowed myself before. If your feelings are still what they were last April, tell me so at once. My, my affections and wishes are unchanged, but one word from you will silence me forever. Lizzie is silent. If your feelings have changed. Darcy looks at her. Something in her eyes gives him confidence. I could. I would have to tell you. You have be with my body and soul. And I love. I love. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> and never wish to be parted from you from this day on. Lizzie looks at him very serious, very simple. Well then. <laughs> Darcy takes a step towards her, one hand stretched out. Lizzie takes a hold of his fingers. You're cold. She kisses his thumb. He sweeps her into his arms on a sound that's half a laugh, half a sob. Interior, drawing room, long burn morning. The place is in an uproar. Jane, Mary, Kitty, Mr. and Mrs. Bennett are all gathered, fretting terribly about Lizzie's whereabouts. Through a window, we see Lizzie lead Darcy along the duckboard plank across the moat. Lizzie enters the house. Everybody starts. Lizzie, where have you been? We thought something had happened to you. Darcy follows Lizzie in. Mr. Darcy, what on earth are you doing here? Lizzie takes Mr. Darcy's hand. Mr. Darcy has come to speak with Papa. Everyone is stunned. Interior, hallway, library, long burning day. Lizzie paces outside the door of the library, waiting. After a while, Darcy emerges, gives Lizzie the briefest, briefest of smiles and leaves the door open. Lizzie walks in. Her father is in a state of shock. Lizzie, are you out of your senses? I thought you hated the man. No, Papa. He is rich, to be sure, and you will have more fine carriages than Jane. But will that make you happy? Have you no other objection than your belief in my indifference? None at all. We all know him to be proud, unpleasant sort of fellow, but this would be nothing if you really liked him. I do like him. <laughs> I love him. He's not proud. I was wrong, entirely wrong about him. You don't know him, Papa. If I told you what he's really like, what he's done. What has he done? Cut to exterior garden and long burn the same. At a window, Mrs. Bennett and the girls watch as Darcy in agony paces up and down the lawn. He looks to the library window. Cut back to interior of the library, long burn the same. Mr. Bennett stares at his daughter. Good lord, I must pay him back. No, you mustn't tell anyone. He wouldn't want it. We misjudged him, me more than anyone, in every way, not just in this matter. I've been nonsensical. He's been a fool about Jane, about so many things. Then, so have I. You see, he and I are so similar. We're both so stubborn. Oh, Papa. Mr. Bennett gazes at his daughter. He still can't quite take it in. You do love him, don't you? Very much. He looks at her earnestly, searching her face. He loves his daughter very deeply. What he sees leaves him in no doubt. I cannot believe that anyone could deserve you, but I, it seems I'm overruled. So I heartily give my consent. Lizzie jumps up and puts her arms around him. I could not have parted with you, my Lizzie, to anyone less worthy. Oh, thank you. She starts to rush out. 
and if any young men come for Mary or Kitty, send them in, for I am quite at leisure. Exterior Pemberley dusk. We see a man's great coat walking away from the camera and widen to reveal Lizzie's hair caught up in the collar of the coat as she turns to someone with a heart-stopping smile. Widen further to reveal Darcy at her side in a nightshirt and breeches, both of them looking as though they just flung themselves out of bed, which is precisely the case. We follow as Darcy has Lizzie clamber onto her fallen tree, which they both sit astride, air feet swinging, looking at, alternatively at the amazing views of Pemberley and each other. And how are you today, my dear? Very well. Only, I wish you would not call me my dear. My dear? Why? <laughs> <laughs> it's what my father always calls my mother when he's cross about something. Oh. What endearment am I allowed? Well, let me think. Lizzie, for every day. My pearl for Sundays. And goddess divine. But only on special occasions. And what I call you when I'm cross? Mrs. Darcy? Oh no. <laughs> you can only you can only call me Mrs. Darcy when you are entirely and perfectly and incandescently happy. He takes her face between his hands. <laughs> <laughs> and how are you this morning, Miss Darcy? Lizzie smiles as he kisses every inch of her face. In between each kiss, he murmurs, Mrs. Darcy. Oh, we, pull oh, away. <laughs> we pull away as this happens, seeing them now looking for all the world like two children, utterly eased with nothing to hide from each other. The end. this? Oh, my. Please.